What's up, guys? If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Also, please smash that like button on the video and enjoy the show. The 60s was just a very tumultuous time for America. Around the corner of that was the 80s. Around the corner of that was the fall of the USSR. Around the corner of that was the fall of the Berlin Wall. So even though you had the Kennedy assassination, even though you had Dr. King being assassinated, even though you had all these horrible things that were happening in America, America was turning a corner into this era of prosperity. like the funny italian like mm -hmm. little traditions and people are like wait what okay whatever sure i guess go right. with it it's cool but you're you're italian german no yes it's a fucking hell of a combo, hell of a right combo. there yep where what, what's your parents story are they from america originally or so my uh my mom is a first generation american no um, shit. yep and that kind of got into why i wanted to go in the military in the first place just because mm. uh the nation has just done so much for my family my uh my umma and my grandfather and then my great aunts on on my mom's side were all born in liebling which is a small village in europe it's not in germany but it's near germany <clears throat> what what is that officially in uh denmark I, or some shit i should know i was just at thanksgiving but <laughs> oh you don't know <laughs> no i think it's in um the same place that arnold schwarzenegger is from well that narrows it down yeah i know right uh, as but they, far as i'm concerned he's from la yeah <laughs> it was a small uh wheat farming village and they were just poor farmers and then the the war mm. came through so when the russians started coming through at that time the ussr they got in wagons and just fled the war and made their way to berlin uh as war refugees and then hung out there for a minute while they were getting their their sponsorship done up and then once that happened they made their way to america how old were your grandparents when that happened so when my umma that's my great-grandmother she must have been um 30. And then she was pregnant with my aunt Kathy at the time. Yep, my grandfather's around. Uh, he's 13 at this time. Um, funny part about our family is we have this family tradition where every year we'll go, uh, it's called uh, lynching or vinching, excuse me. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's the wrong one right there. That. <laughs> well, we, uh, we say the stupid German thing. Like uh, my mom taught me the, the girl version. You say, ich winch, ich winch, ich was na was, greifen die sock und give na was which roughly translates into hey you know i'm a good little german girl reach into your pocket and give navas give me something nice so every year sounds like the hitler youth right there dude <laughs> oh my God. i'm terrible i'm sorry no, no, i'm sure your mom's a nice lady you're right uh so every year like you'll give the kids a dollar and like we play rummy with it and we make wooshed every year Interesting. so the firstborn or the oldest boy in the family always wears this jacket that my grandfather came over uh to america with he was 13 when he wore it. Most boys in the family now, they wear it when they're like seven or eight mm. because people were smaller back then because there was less food to go around. Oh. This jacket, dude, it has like, the buttons are made out of like reindeer uh, antlers. The, yeah. the fiber is hand woven. Like it's been in our family forever. And uh, just because it, it shows the disparity between what America is normal to us and then just how the rest of the world lives. And I was always really, I was raising that. I was always very appreciative of that. And that kind of led into my burning desire to just join the military in the first place to give but, back. But you said, did I hear this right? Your, your grandpa was 13 and your grandma was 30 mm -hmm. when the world, when the war was going on. Yep. So she, she, uh, she cleaned up after the war, huh? Yeah. She got, she got the nice young calf right mm -hmm. there. Absolutely. Not bad. Not bad. That's an interesting family story because. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, it's kind of, to me, almost a forgotten part of history when you look at, say, the, let's call it like the 10, 15 years after the war in Germany mm -hmm. and what a shit show that yeah. was. Have you ever read, uh, what the fuck is it called? It's Annie Jacobson's book on the Operation Paperclip. I think it might actually literally be called Operation Paperclip. I should remember that. I'll look it up in a minute. But did you ever read that by any no, chance? No, I did not. When you hear the accounts of just what a clusterfuck this was, it blows your mind because obviously, like, it's of their own making mm -hmm. with everything that happened there. Let's make that very clear. Sure. But it was this dystopian, just 
you know, you don't really live in a country. You live in this, I mean, you'd call it an occupied territory, but mm -hmm. I wouldn't even say that. You had the Russians coming in from one angle, the U.S. coming in from another angle. They're both like running to the town that they're supposed to be divvying up to the other person before one to the other country before one actually gets there so they can get their intel before the other country and then they're stealing all the nazi scientists and yep. shit in the middle of it it was just the citizens are you know it, there's plenty of them who were i'm sure just under the nazi regime and obviously didn't have a choice there mm -hmm. and those are the ones who along with the regular old nazis got like sucked up into it yep. and you hear a lot of these stories where there's people who were just they're like i don't know if we're gonna live tomorrow and they found a way to get out and and find refuge in in other countries like america which it sounds like obviously your grandparents did my utta was one of those people yeah so just because he was a military age male at the time when the nazis were rolling through they said hey guess what you're a nazi now because we yeah. need service aged males to be in the military here's a rifle wow yep that's some heavy shit what it did, I mean, is he still alive? No, uh, my Uta passed uh, a long time ago, but it's just- Did he ever talk about it? No, I never met him. Uh, he died before I was born, but uh, unfortunately my grandfather and him had a very rough relationship. Wait, wait, wait. Your Uta is not- So my Uta, that's a German word. That was his actual name. That is the, the husband of my grandma. Right, and then you just said your grandpa and him had a terrible relationship? That's his son, my grandfather. Umma is a German word that means grandmother. We always called her Umma. She, in reality, oh. is my great-grandmother. I'm sorry, I'm really confused. Mm -hmm. But you're calling one your grandfather, and you're calling his son your grandfather. So there's my Umma, which is my great-grandmother. Oh, uh, great. Okay. It is his, or her, excuse me, husband. They had sorry. children, and then they came over here. Okay, I missed that. So that's yep. your great grandfather. There's a lot of German words got mixed it, into that. Got yep. it. Yeah, I hope everyone followed that. But that's that's pretty wild. So you you never met him, but did your dad like ever dad or your mom ever talk to you about you know like his experiences with the war or your grandma's experiences with the war and Quite how honestly, they felt about it? Yep, uh, I was just at Thanksgiving talking to my aunt Kathy about exactly all this, and what she said is a lot of the normal people that were just caught in the war wanted to surrender almost immediately to the yeah. to the American people. They didn't want to fight. They knew the war was over. Obviously, it was a horrible cause to begin with in the first place, and they wanted to get captured by Americans. Sounds about right. Yep. You'd rather be captured by Americans than fucking Russians exactly. at that point. It was the Soviet Union. There was all kinds of shit going on. Yep. I'm sure there was shit going on with some of the Americans too, to be honest with you. But mm -hmm. it, it just, it's it's crazy to try to put your finger in history and go there. And just that whole, that whole thing, like I think about that, the Holocaust was not even, those camps weren't even freed 80 years ago. Yep. That's not that so, long. I was talking to my Aunt Kathy about exactly this, and what she said is when they were making their way to Berlin, just as they were getting closer to Germany, they could smell burning flesh oh. in the air just because of what was going on. Oh. And the crazy part is, like, you, you read this in history books, but these are normal people that are just caught in the middle of this. Yes. And they're trying to find their way to a, a safe haven where the war is not going on and history is happening around them. There are some people, though, where it's like, I don't know how I feel about that, where you had the villages that were extremely close to some of these camps. Yep. And there's no way they didn't smell that. Of course. You know, have you seen those videos at the end of the war when Eisenhower and I think Patton, too, made those people visit the camps? Just to see what's going on. Dude, we've played that on this podcast before. I'll put some of that in the corner of the screen the stuff that's appropriate for youtube mm -hmm. but i mean you see the real you know you see angst on there they're, yep. they're human beings and they not like the people that ran those camps and everything nope. but it's like how do you ignore i know it people will say like well what could they have done about it i mean what could a lot of these people have done about stuff there's people who hid people there's people who did all kinds of brave shit during that time and it's like to be a whole village and smell that every day and and be like oh you know we're not going to worry about it that has just never sat right with me sure. and then you know you still have people today who and it's not that many people but it blows my mind when there's people who like deny that that happened it's like the, why, why the fuck do we even have video then like, i think what, you know what i mean people compartmentalize very easily like we were talking about yeah. just how there was less calories going around people were just worried about feeding themselves let alone what's going on in the world and i think people yeah. today unfortunately are no different they just kind of 
mind their own business and whatever happens around them happens around them. And you're saying that in today's times that can lead to people then finding ways to be pissed off about things and deciding that something's how it is. Of course. I think you're right about that. Yep. I think that's probably how, you know, especially with conspiracies and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, when you look at the crazy shit, not that stuff, but, you know, when, when people are trying to, or they are taking the side of like, they're, they're trying to deny something like the Holocaust. It's like, well, how does that start? It starts with you needing to find a meaning in something because you're mad about something else and you're finding a boogeyman and this must be what explains it. And it's like, obviously there are, when you look at like today's government and stuff like mm -hmm. that, of course, like the, if you look at the word conspiracy, it's actually like, not a loaded word. When nope. you say conspiracy theory, now it starts to get loaded. But yes, there's there's little conspiracies of everything, and, and some of them probably are actually not bad, but then there's some that are bad that are true. But people will throw out 10,000 things, mm -hmm. and in those 10,000, you know, there will be the five that are true. Sure. But now its job is the burden of proof to prove itself among a group where the people claiming it are throwing out 9,995 other things that are bullshit. Mm -hmm. You see, like, it's hard. And it's even hard, like, when you look at the alien conversation and stuff like that, I still come at that from, like, the skeptic lens. I believe they exist. But, like, you know, there's stories that I hear, and then I, I look at the evidence we do have, and it's hard to deny it. Yep. But I still, like, toss and turn at night, like, oh, did that happen? You know, which one is it? Mm -hmm. You know, it's tough. It's, it's a tough world. We were kind of talking about this before we started rolling. I just want to believe all the alien stuff so bad. Yeah. I know I have an unbiased perspective with it. Yeah. But I know, uh, if memory serves me correctly, the term conspiracy theory came after the JFK assassination. Correct. And the U.S. government invented that term in the first place to kind of sway people to say, hey, I know some things don't look right, but it's a conspiracy theory. If you even draw your, draw any attention to it. Correct. I, um, I don't know if they invent... I always... I'm careful how I say that or try to be, I hope, mm -hmm. but I don't know if they officially invented the term. It may have existed before, but they popularized it into the lexicon under that new yep. definition for sure. So they invented that aspect. That was it. the catalyst for sure. And yeah, I mean, I would love to be a fly on the wall in the room where they had that discussion. Yep. That's all I'll say. And I think too, in that era, you could get away with so much more. No one had a, uh, a camera in their pocket things were easier to hide. So my hope is that um, as people or as technology advances, a lot of these things are getting tougher to hide. But I don't know. We The last three years have been absolutely crazy for everybody. So yeah. I, I can't even imagine what's going on behind closed doors now. Yeah. Now, as far as you go, though, mm -hmm. you, you hinted at it a little bit, which before we even get into it, I got to say, you're the most prepared guest I've ever had in my life. I appreciate life, it, man. And I appreciate you flying out here on your own dime. Mm -hmm. you, you did not have to do that. I, As I say with the guests, like I pay for guests to come in here as far mm -hmm. as the travel expenses and stuff like that. But when it's too far, like, you know, I still live in my parents' house and I'm poor. So, <laughs> you know, I can't quite afford it. But you, yep. you were like, no problem coming out here. So thank you for doing that. Of course. But, you know, I'm looking, you got fucking spreadsheets and shit. You got, like, notes written in military form and everything. So what, what's going on here? Is this, like, a booklet we got? We're trying to be legit about it here. Uh, <laughs> I do have a cheesy disclaimer I have to read. Um, okay, but let's we'll, start with that. We'll roll through that pretty quick. <clears throat> the opinions stated in the following podcast are completely my own and in no way, shape, or form represent the United States Air Force, the Department of Defense, any current or former employer of mine, or the United States government. They are simply my experiences living and working in austere forward deployed environments in support of the global war on terror and my very human and very flawed interpretations of the events discussed. Perfect. All right. So we got that out. This guy has his own opinions. Deal with him. Yep. That's it. Easy That's fair. Enough. So you got into the military when you were like 18, you were telling me, right? 18, right out of high school. What was the thought there? Did you always want to do that growing up? So or? because of my family background, uh, I always had a debt of gratitude that I had to pay back to this wonderful country that mm. we all share. Um, but the decision point was, okay, if I'm going to do this military thing, um, what branch I joined and more specifically what job I actually do while I was in was always the big deciding point. Mm. My mentality walking into it was, <clears throat> okay, if I'm going to become government property for four years and regardless of what branch I join or what job I do, that's going to be the case. I want to get the absolute most out of them as they are going to get out of me. Mm. I want it to be a mutually beneficial relationship. Unfortunately, what I think happens is a lot of vets, uh, have a rough time transitioning out. 
and in many cases, unfortunately, take steps back after they leave the military. Their life um, doesn't improve after they get out. I wanted to take every step possible to not be one of those people. Mm. So uh, when it came time to picking a branch specifically, um, I talked to all the recruiters, I talked to the Army, I talked to the Navy. Um, it was interesting that the Air Force guy wasn't even there in the recruiting office to begin with. And I took note of that because I quickly learned the Air Force doesn't really need to recruit in the first place. Why is that? They have the best gig, in my opinion. <laughs> and what I mean by that is just by the mission set of the Air Force, the weapon systems that you work on, the uh, type of work that you'll be doing, the technical nature of the job, in many ways, you can essentially have a paid internship for the military industrial complex or the defense sector while you are serving. And that was the first play or the first bet that I wanted to make with my life. I wanted to pick a job that not only had a military need, but a civilian need. So mm. when it came time to separate, um, I had options. I didn't have to re-enlist. You were prepared as a person, like just in Tried general. to be. Yeah. So that's definitely a trait mm -hmm. of yours. So with the Air Force, you don't go in there the first time, or you go in there the first time mm -hmm. to do the research and talk with these different teams and they're not there. How long before you actually got on their radar or you found your way? Quite there? honestly, about a month. It was hounding mm -hmm. down people, trying to find recruiters, trying to send emails. And then I finally got in contact with someone and um, I started talking with him. I had uh, a couple things that I wanted to accomplish uh, as far as what job I wanted to pick. The first and foremost was I wanted a job that required or would give me some sort of security clearance. And the reason I knew this was so important was because if you get this security clearance with your time spent in the military, it makes you a lot more employable when you finally come out. That is mm. essentially like a, a, guys will describe it as a golden ticket to start working in the defense sector. And the reason this is the case is because all the big defense contractor companies, we all know the names of them, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, L3 Harris, those companies will negotiate a contract between the United States government and the private entities themselves to build weapon systems or products that are ultimately sold to the US government. Once that contract is established, the military has a special requirement that says, hey, <clears throat> any product that we sell that you will ultimately maintain, the people and the individuals that maintain that weapon system or fix the computers or the airplanes or the whatever, when they break, they have to be cleared and investigated because of the nature of the work. We can't hire Joe off the street because Joe off the street could be oh, a Chinese asset or right. a Russian asset. And these right. are really technical weapon systems. So if I'm Raytheon, I have two choices. I can hire a dude off the street and pay to get him investigated, which is very costly and very expensive. Um, and in many cases, you're, you're taking a chance on a person. I don't know a person's immigration background. I don't know their family history. This investigation is not only, it takes a long time, but it may not come back in my favor. So I'm spending a lot of time and money on a person that might not work out for us. What goes, so when they do those investigations, how much, it's not like a background check that I do if I go mm -hmm. for a job where, you know, they run me through some system. Like, do they do like private investigators on these people and I all had, that shit? I had a private investigator assigned to me. And I gave them contacts and they knocked on doors and said, hey, do you know John Bonelli? Um, is he a person that you would trust with national security? What was he like in high school? Is this a good person? Mm. And I couldn't. So talk, they were open about it. I couldn't talk to that person directly. But, but they were open about that. Yes. They, they brief you and say, hey, we're going to look into your life. They look into your credit score. They look into um, almost every facet of you to make sure you're a, uh, an American that is not compromised as an asset. Because we're going to be trusting you with very sensitive information. So if I'm that company, uh, if I have that relationship with the U.S. government, I can either pay to have that happen or I can hire guys who already have the clearance paid for by the government in the first place and plug them in directly to the products that we're already selling. Now, how, especially from the private sector, because mm -hmm. they're not officially government, air right. quotes, how reliable do you honestly think that is? Because like I remember there was someone I went to college with who smoked more fucking weed than anyone else. I got a call one day from someone at some government, it was a mm. government thing or something. Sure. And they're like, oh, do you know this person? Did he ever smoke? I'm like, no, no, I, <laughs> fuck no. And, and then I get off the phone, I'm like, shit, am I going to get in trouble for that? Like, sure. is that what I was supposed to say? But they just took it. He got hired. He's doing great today. Yep. But you know what I mean? Like stuff like that. It, sometimes I think about that and it's almost like it's checking a box mm -hmm. rather than, you know, 
So the big things that they care about, um, the weed thing, and I'm not an investigator, I can't speak to this officially, but I've been, I've heard that has changed a little bit just with the, the social tides. Obviously on paper, hey, you can't smoke weed in the military or in the defense sector, but the big things they're looking for is, hey, uh, is this person a Russian asset to begin with? And the big thing is, hey, is this person uh, financially sound? Because if I have a person that has bad credit or a bunch of credit cards that are open and has $50,000 worth of debt, he is more easily compromisable. If I'm Russian, I say, right. hey, for 100 grand, I can make all your problems go away. Just toss me some secrets. Um, you give me a weapon. <laughs> exactly. It's easier to, to lean on those people. Yeah. Hey, guys, cutting in to let you know that after we finish recording this episode, John and I sat down for another 50 to 60 minutes on camera and recorded a Patreon-only episode that will be available on the Julian Dory Podcast Patreon within two days of this video going live on YouTube. So check that out. Link in description as well as on the channel page. And if you're on Spotify, it is on the show page description. Furthermore, if you haven't already subscribed to our Clips channel on YouTube, YouTube, please do that. We have been putting out clips every single day. Alessi Alaman is killing it. It's content from the podcast that you've come to know and love. So I would really appreciate you guys going over there and showing that channel support. The link is in my current channel page as well as in the description to this episode. Yeah, and, and it's actually like I know Andy Bustamante talks about that a lot. He's mm -hmm. talked about it, I think, every podcast I've been on him with where a lot of the leaks, most of them, actually come out of – the private sector, yep. air quotes, big air quotes, with their former public sector employees mm -hmm. who are now quite literally still read in on everything they had when they were being paid by the government instead. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure I had a job that did that, and then I wanted some sort of technical background as well to go along with it. Once I found a job that checked those two check marks, I knew, hey, this was going to be something that was not only beneficial for me, but beneficial for the government. Did you worry about working with people, though, who – because obviously, like, you have all your ducks in a row. I'm not worried mm -hmm. about you. But especially as someone like you who's analytical and mm -hmm. clearly thinks about all this shit, did you worry about, oh, am I going to be working with people that I got to look at funny? Because, you know, someone's got a gambling debt. Someone is behind on their housing payment, just like you were just saying mm -hmm. a couple minutes ago. You know, and you're now dealing with things where you're still serving your country in this sure. respect in the private sector, and that's how you look at it. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, you could be dealing with some traitorous shit. Was that thought like ever in your head? The guys in uniform were always cleared. So this crazy intensive process uh, was applicable to all of us. If you wore a uniform and you had a security clearance and you were read into the respective program, the U.S. government goes out of its way to make sure that those are the right people who get access to very specific information. And the reason they do that is not only for uh, a dollars and cents perspective, but just because if any of that information gets leaked, it's not only their problem, but it's everybody's problem. So they, it. they make sure that the right people are in the right places at the right time. Got it. So back to you when you were coming into the Air Force, though, and mm -hmm. working. So you're eight. were you still 18 once I'm you started? at this time. Yep. But like when you actually started working? 18 as well. I turned 19 when I was in tech school. Got it. So okay. the, the timeline of this is uh, I signed that job. The job I ended up picking was a cyber transporter. That's a very Air force -y way of saying network engineer. Which in English? That means uh, we work with enterprise-grade networking. Uh, all right. I, I English, know. not Japanese. Got Come it. On. Got it. Got it. <laughs> so we make computers uh, talk and share information between one another on an enterprise level. Meaning instead mm. of 10 computers talking to one another, we make 200 or 500 computers talk to one now another. Now, how does that work? Like, is that as simple as coding something in there? You use devices like routers and switches to make it work. So we were trained how to do that on an Air Force wide level. So I, my job in the Air Force was to make all the computers on an Air Force installation share information with one another and also share it uh, securely in an encrypted fashion. Oh, now is this the thing? I think we were talking about this when we were on the phone and you might have mentioned it today. So tell me if I'm way off mm -hmm. base. But you were saying as a part of, the, I think it was this job, you would... It would be a main facet on a day-to-day -day where you would be instantly translating radar transmissions from active planes and helicopter Apaches and stuff to be able to have it live stream for the generals on the ground who could view exactly what the pilot was viewing to ensure that any targets that were taken out were what they wanted and give the green light. That job that I did uh, came after my time in the Air Force. Okay. So that's the, I, I skipped ahead. I'm sorry. No, you're more than good. So I was a cyber transporter for about four years in the Air Force. 
And just to give some context to any military guys that are listening, uh, most cyber transporters, they get assigned to uh, air, or excuse me, they get assigned to uh, cyber squadrons or communication squadrons. Okay. These are squadrons that are responsible for exactly what I was talking about, making sure all the computers on an Air Force base are secure and share information correctly between one another. When I was in tech school and I had orders cut, which is where it's a big deal because you're learning where you're going to spend the next three years of your life, I was assigned to an aircraft maintenance squadron. And I thought it was some mm. sort of uh, mess up on their part. So I, I marched to the uh, march to the MTL and say, hey, sir, you know, I think there's a problem here. And he says, no, you're going exactly where you need to go. Turns have a written out report like that? Turns out. <laughs> um, yes. Yes, you did. <laughs> yeah. Turns out uh, the assets that I was working on, even though they were cyber assets or communication assets, the Air Force viewed them as mm. aircraft components. And that's unfortunately all I can say about it. But I can say it was uh, an RPA program that I worked and that we worked specifically with uh, collecting intelligence on um, adversaries that at the time w were in the desert. So the global war on terror was still occurring and then uh, near peer threats. So you've had other guests on the podcast that have talked about who those people are or who those, who those nations What'd are. What you said it was near peer? Near peer threats, meaning threats that are near the capabilities of the United States, uh, but not at the capability of the United States. Oh, I think I follow that. Yep. So we would collect intelligence on them. I did that for okay. three years while I was in the Air Force. And then um, when I got out, I was- Well, wait a second. Let's stay there. I, I want to make sure I get this. So okay. when you're collecting intelligence on them, you're at your desk on the base. Because when you were in the Air Force, that's when you were domestic. And mm -hmm. when then when you were a defense contractor afterwards, that's when you went abroad, right? That's when I stepped overseas. Okay. So when you're in the Air Force and you're working, where, what was your base? So unfortunately, I can't say where exactly. No, okay, no problem. Yep. So some base in the fucking US or somewhere. Yep. And you'd be collecting intelligence. How would you go get that? And what was your role in collecting that intelligence? Our piece of the pie was I was a computer guy. So I would make sure all the, all the computer assets were working correctly. And because they were aircraft components, uh, the training that I received when I was actually in tech school or the, the pipeline where I learned how to actually do this job, um, it was very different for how the Air Force views maintaining communication assets. Meaning the, the, the training mentality that was apparent for most cyber guys was not apparent in the maintenance world. And what I mean by that is the Air Force really cares about how planes are, how planes take off and land perfectly every time. Yeah. Meaning uh, they really care about assets landing and launching perfectly. If that doesn't happen, people start dying. So I had to make sure that all the communication assets and all the equipment that I was working on, that it was documented correctly and maintained correctly. That framework was not trained to me in the training that I received in technical school. I had to learn that being in a, in a maintenance squadron. So my piece of mm. the pie was when all these communication assets would break or needed service, I was the person that would actually fix them. I would then hand that equipment off to the ops team. This is the sensor operators, the pilots that actually fly these assets and do the collecting themselves. We would work in tandem with one another. Got it. Okay. So there's a lot going on mm -hmm. when you were over there, clearly. Yep. So how, how many years was that? So I did that for three years. Okay. Yep. And... Um, once I finished up my, my enlistment with the Air Force, I had a burning desire to do more. So I love the time when I was in. I met a bunch of incredible, amazing people. But some of the deployments that I went on, I'm going to steal a term from one of my buddies who was also serving with me. He said, uh, I felt as though I was working in a very hot airport for six months. And that's a very good way of describing it. Mm. And I just had this burning desire to do more. I wanted Blackhawk rides. I wanted plate carriers. I wanted Rippet. I wanted Copenhagen. And specifically- What's Rippet? Rippet is a, uh, for any of the GWAC guys that are listening- they What's are GWAC guys? Global War on Terror. Oh, you have a, there's an acronym for that? Yep. No shit, okay. So they are these little de, uh, deployable energy drinks that the US government buys. They're like an off-brand monster and they airdrop them to all, all the guys that are in four deployed environments in Afghanistan or Iraq, just as a caffeine morale <laughs> booster. So- uh, Probably they, like cocaine or some shit. <laughs> they have be, kind of become a little meme. Like the, the slogan of the company uh, was memed as, hey, this is the official energy drink of war. Oh, so they would nice. they would always pair drop these little energy drinks to guys that were deployed. 
fucking Dwight Eisenhower is rolling over in his grave. Yep. This, is what he was, this is what he was worried about. Energy drinks and war zones, baby. So I wanted that. And I this, the mission that I had in the Air Force didn't allow me to do that. So one of my favorite parts about the defense sector or the military industrial complex was I felt as though that the control was put back in my life. I could only apply to jobs or I only wanted to apply to jobs that were specifically in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. So when you go to a, okay, I didn't really know that. When mm -hmm. you go to apply for jobs, they'll tell you on some of these like high level, you know, private sector, government related shit, they'll tell you exactly where you're gonna be before you apply. Depending on the contract, um, I made it a point to only apply to certain jobs that were applicable to this particular region, but there are contracts everywhere. You can get a job uh, in Florida or in Germany. I was only applying to these specific jobs because it was, it was where specifically I wanted to go. You wanted to be in the middle of the shit. Now. Yep. You had done the, the domestic part. You wanted to be over there. I wanted more. And did you want... Did you want like action too, or were you looking to take your skill set and just be on ground over there with the guys who were on ground? Quite honestly, I wanted all of it. I wanted to all make more it. money. I wanted to be in a forward deployed environment. I wanted to eat MREs. I wanted to live in an austere, austere environment for months at a time. Um, one of my favorite parts about this job was as an FSR or an ambassador to the company that I worked for, you are tech support. So when the system breaks, there's no back infrastructure. That no you Geek can, Squad? No, you're it. Shit. So you have to fix the assets when they break. Mm. And how, I mean, how many people are on your team doing that with you? We worked in two-man pairs. So mm. it was me and another guy. We would typically work days and nights. And um, I spent close to three years doing that job. Were you on, a, were you on bases when you were doing this? Mm -hmm. Were you in offices? Like, at what, what was the layout? So I'll break it down even further. Yeah. When you're in a, a deployed world, <clears throat> the first, uh, we'll take Afghanistan, for example, because no one's there anymore, unfortunately. Yeah. The big logistical hub was Bagram. Bagram is where, hey, if you're getting deployed to Afghanistan, you're going to fly here, touch down, um, drop bags, and it's the big logistical base that everything breaks off into. So beyond Afghanistan, there are uh, more forward bases called FOBs, or forward operating bases. These are touch-off points where units sit and can do missions in the local area. Even smaller places are called COPs, which is combat outposts, or fire bases, mm. where even smaller units sit on, where they can even more remotely go into the local villages, do missions from that point. And the, all these locations are scattered all throughout in this case, Afghanistan. What I would do is I would fly around between all these locations and fix uh, these systems that were breaking. Now, I, I, what years is this approximately? This is, so I got it in 2019 and then I did this till uh, a year ago. So you were doing this after the fall of Afghanistan? Yes. Okay, so let's start with Afghanistan mm -hmm. though, because that's what you were talking about. Yep. How, what was, especially towards the end there then, mm -hmm. What was security like for that? I mean, and how were you, did you have military support going from place to place to place? Like, what did this look like? Anytime we would move, uh, we obviously had military support with us because we had to make sure that all Americans were protected and safe. Um, my job in the four deployed situations were, I'll give you an example. Uh, because Afghanistan has a lot of bounds in it, it makes our systems very difficult from a line of sight perspective to get links or to get a handshake between other systems. Meaning <clears throat> our systems were based on line of sight systems, meaning one piece of equipment had to see another piece of equipment. And the topography of Afghanistan made mm. that very difficult because of the mountains in the region. So uh, one of the ground commanders, one of the guys, our customer that we were working for directly, wanted coverage in a particular region that we didn't have. So I came to him and said, hey, sir, I know you want to run missions out of this particular part of Afghanistan, but we don't have coverage here. If you give me a Chinook and load it with the equipment, I can build you a remote site out of this fire base have that site link back to our main base in this part, and we can get handshake between these two uh, nodes or satellite hubs, and you can run missions out of here. This is, this is the crazy part to me and guys like me who have never been over there and just you know hear the broad stories about what happens, but all the little things on the ground of just like going and installing something mm -hmm. like that. I mean, you could be installing that in the middle of some village somewhere where God knows what people there are like you and what people don't. You know, mm -hmm. like these are all, in, in a way, you're constantly 
I mean, it's a, it's technically still a war zone at that point, yep. clearly. So you are constantly in a life and death situation to set up tech in this mm-hmm. case. You know, it's like I made the G- the Geek Squad joke a couple minutes ago, but it's like you're doing that That's at a way like, higher level and like you're in the middle of a war zone. Pressure's on. Mm-hmm. Crazy. No, I loved every second of it. And, and <laughs> quite honestly, man, um, if I can be a little humorous here, when I, when I had this job described to me or I got the elevator pitch for this job, I must have had a hard on for a week. Like I just, I loved every single facet about it. The whole purpose of the system was we would take a video feed coming from fast moving aircraft, meaning F-16s, A-10, or an AWT, an air weapons team, which is a fancy way of saying an Apache helicopter. Mm. All these aircraft have what are called pods on them. Pods is, um, they're the very high tech camera systems that actually sit on these aircraft. And my system would uh, touch in or get handshake to these pod systems. So the team on the ground could see in real time what the pilot was seeing. And what this does from a uh, capabilities perspective is it gives the ground commander or the ground team the ability to see in real time what the pilot is seeing. What this does is it gives the JTAC or the forward deployed controller, this is the person who's actually talking to the plane in the air, telling him where, where to fly and what people to kill. He can see what the pilot is seeing. So it gives everybody a better understanding and a better picture of what's going on. Yeah. I, I mean, there's just so many. It, I, my head hurts when I start thinking about this and how many how many pieces went into this. Because then you see, like, for example, what the end in Afghanistan was yep. and how you left all this shit behind there. It was obviously a clusterfuck of a pullout. And, you know, it, it's it was... A culmination of a failure of a of a twenty year war because Agreed. we we essentially took our eye off the ball with once Iraq happened in '03 things were probably going pretty well frankly for the most part in Afghanistan before that and then it was kind of like it sucks to say this but in the war game of life it was like the redheaded stepchild war like oh yeah that one you know what I mean and so you had some great resources in there. But your heaviest resources were put into other places. The focus of the public came off it. And all the while, you still have a crazy leadership of the Taliban who just went into the woods and into the mountains and started to rebuild. And in this country, in America, we only think about tomorrow. We Uh think about maybe next week, right? When you look at other countries around the world, for better or worse, depending on where it is, they're thinking about 10 years from now. They're thinking about 20 years from now. And that is what... That is what the Taliban did. And so as a guy who was there uniquely for the end of this part, you know, first of all, were, were you on the ground when the pullout happened? Were you still there? No. Uh, in this case, I was actually in between deployments. I was supposed to be at Bagram when this was happening. How long before that did you leave? Two months. So not long. No, it was it was pretty quick. And you, the announcement, the earliest announcements that like, oh, this is a reality, were in March of that year, I think. The crazy part, and I think the logistical failure is how quickly it happened. Yes. Everything was just, in my opinion, left without proper uh, documentation and proper processes of bringing all the equipment and all the arms and all the military equipment back properly. And the ironic part is the Taliban and the shitheads that were trying to kill us were shooting at us with weapon systems that the Russians left from yeah. a previous war. And now if you see video footage that the Taliban has now, all their kit and all their rifles and all their equipment is leftover American military equipment. History has literally repeated itself. It happens to do that in that country a lot. Yep. When you look at when you look at world history and empires, there's a reason they say like empires fall in Afghanistan. But you know, when you left Bagram in between deployments, I guess that was like June or something. You said it was mm-hmm. two months before. Did you, as you were leaving, did you think like, ooh, this is going to be the last time I'm here? No, I was just trying to get home at the time. Everything happened so quickly. I ha- actually had orders or I was supposed to be in Syria following that. Um, but it just, it was a catastrophic failure from a leadership perspective, in my opinion. And then just a logistical perspective, like how much equipment was left behind, right. how quickly we left. The real failure, in my opinion, and this is just my personal experiences just seeing this, was there was a disconnect between what was actually happening on the ground and what was being briefed in Washington. And I don't know if that was a choice that information was being left out or people were hearing relevant information and choosing not to believe it. Here's what I mean by that. So we would work our whole mission where we would we would support the ANA or the Afghanistan National Army. This is the army 
that the American military spent tax dollars and money and training, uh, training and equipping to fight the Taliban on our behalf. The whole mission being, hey, these individuals are going to fight the war for us so that someone from Arkansas, a 19-year-old kid from Arkansas, doesn't have to die in this war anymore. So when you would meet these individuals, you would see the disparity between the American military and the military of a third world country, even oh, yeah. with American tax dollars behind it. Mm -hmm. So in our case, we were doing tick response, which means troops in contact. Anytime uh, an ANA element would get ticked up, meaning they would take contact from um, <clears throat> Taliban forces, they would request whatever air assets we were allocated. So whether that's an F-16 or uh, an Apache, they would request air support, hey, we're getting shot at. We would fly over that asset, kill all the Taliban, and then everybody got home safe. So the end state was that the ANA, or the Afghanistan National Army, would eventually take over this mission. Mm. But when you would see these people, and you would see what day-to-day -day life looks, looks like for them, you would know that that would never be the case. These individuals, in many cases, were high. Yeah. They were on drugs most of the time. Yeah. These individuals would have what are called NDs or negligent, negligent discharges, meaning they would just pop off rounds next to you because of how just untrained they were with their weapons. Um, no military bearing. Just there was a big disparity between American standards and the standards of the ANA. It seemed like a part of the problem was you base it. The system that ended up getting set up felt like hired guns that another country was setting up as their own little personal science project. Mm -hmm. And the people it was attracting were not people who were doing it for any type of patriotic cause, right? Like you talked about your reason to want to serve here. It's a lot of the same types of reasons that a lot mm -hmm. of people who, not everyone, but a lot of people go into the military about. Sure. They want to serve their country. There's a higher calling with it. Even I, I think it was Vice did some little docu series. I think it was them on some of the train. What was it? A and A. You said it's called on exactly that. Like some of the train Afghanistan armies before anything fell. And it's like, oh, this is hopeless. It's exactly as you described it. I mean, it it wasn't. There was no. There was no zest for or or a higher calling for what they were doing. I think what this boils down to is we were kind of talking about World War II a minute ago. The reason why that war was as successful as it was and the reason why the timelines were so much shorter, we're talking about a global war that lasted four years versus the GWAT, which lasted two decades, was America was all in on the conflict, meaning there was a draft going on. Every dollar that was spent in the United States yeah. went directly to the war effort. There was no plan B. There was, we're going to win this and no one's coming home until we do. Yes. This was some war that was just kicked down the road over the yes. can was kicked down the road over the period of 20 years. And this thing just snowballed from, Hey, we have to get the people that are responsible for nine 11 into, Hey, now we have to turn Afghanistan into a nation where it is a third world country, but we're going to bring it into the first world. And we're going to make sure that nine 11 never happens again because of the American support and, and the democratic values that are now established in Afghanistan. And that's where the problems exist because taking people that, uh, are living from a technological perspective a long time ago, from a cultural perspective uh, in the Stone Ages in many cases. Um, it's very, it takes a long time and it takes a lot of resources and the American, the American public just doesn't have the stomach for that. How would you have done it? So you, like we said, you had heard at least that there was the plan to pull out, which a lot of presidents had said before and never done. So it might have been like a false flag in some in some ways for guys who were on the ground like, yeah, okay, I'll believe this when I see it. Sure. But once it once it's actually going down, obviously it was a clusterfuck that's been established. But how could you have done it where it wasn't considering the fact that at that point the ship had sailed on the whole, oh, we beat the Taliban. The Taliban was very much going to win on a percentage basis and the Afghan government had already failed. I would say the commitment to define goals from the beginning need to be established. What do you Meaning, mean by that? Okay. <clears throat> I'll tell a quick story that kind of embodies this point. We did uh, surveillance on a particular area. And in this particular area, we found a, uh, a defensive position where the Taliban would kill everybody in this particular valley. So a and troops would roll by in their convoys and they would get ticked up from uh, this defensive position at the top of this hill. Mm -hmm. So being the motivated Americans that we are, we put up a strike package for that particular position. Hey, we want to put a JDAM on this yesterday, blow it up. A what? Uh, JDAM is a big missile. 
So we wanted to uh, remove that position because it would make everybody safer. So we put up the strike package, uh, got everything signed off. That particular strike package got shot down because that particular position was close to an uh, Afghanistan cemetery. And for mm -hmm. cultural reasons, we couldn't blow up that position. So in our minds, what we viewed that as was, hey, the American government cares more about dead Afghans than they do alive ones at this particular moment. Why are we here in the first place? Mm. These people, the, the Taliban guys who would shoot, shoot at guys, they would retrograde or retreat to mosques every time they would try to shoot at either civilians or American forces. Yeah, cover. They knew the American military wouldn't blow up a religious site. In World War II, that wasn't the case. Anywhere there was a Nazi, we would shoot and kill them. Here's the difference, though. There's global communication, and there's an ability to, to propagandize anything. Sure. And the minute you know it, just as well as I do, the minute we nuke a mosque or something, oh, that's getting out. That's well, that, going to be a problem. This is what we're talking about. World War II time frame, the mentality was, if we don't do this, that's happening here. And the Japanese and the Germans, they don't care what happens I'm not in America. Saying, I'm not saying you're wrong. I, I I think you're I think you're a hundred percent right about that. I'm saying that unfortunately we live in a world now where we are already in places we shouldn't be in. And you know what? If you want to blame some of this on Iraq, go ahead because right. that's true. Like that was some Halliburton bullshit going in there. So once you already went in and fucked up all those people's lives, like if you watch documentaries of people from Iraq who talk about Iraq under Saddam before then were certainly he was a horrible guy and there were some there was some terrible shit going on but like as far as like day-to-day -day life if you didn't get too involved with stuff like they had some normalcy mm -hmm. and then it was stripped from them and it's sure. this crazy sectarian fucking hellhole because of us going in there for no reason so once we do that fuck wherever it is Afghanistan Iraq wherever somewhere in the Middle East the minute we start not appreciating certain cultural norms they will use it against us it's the same reason that they they literally technically gave like osama bin laden an actual proper burial so that no sure. one could hit them on it and like as much as like i'd like to see them fucking throw his body wherever the fuck it is i understand why they did that mm -hmm. you know so I, I i understand this mentality but i also get why that's very frustrating for the guys like you on the ground who are trying to do the job to me this is a shit or a fart situation you're sure. kind of fucked either way and this is where it gets into the area of hey should guys even go in the first place because okay all these poor guys like i was a lucky i was a lucky one man like i i have all all my fingers and all my toes and i came back safely mm. there are guys that didn't and i did so as a defense contractor man like I, I was not serving when i was over there there are kids that gave life and limb for this country yes. and we're men that were doing it and the sad part is after all the american lives and treasure that were spent in this particular region it all fell apart in three weeks and it makes you wonder okay was all that sacrifice even worth it in the first place and arguably now the taliban is more trained and equipped today than they were 20 years ago because of all the weapon systems that we left over so how i feel about it is if you're not willing to stomach the horrible atrocities that are involved in war don't go in the first place mm. because American American lives are going to be spent in, in, in the process. And if you're not willing to, to accept the burden that comes along with war, don't ask people to go. How do you feel about the Ukraine thing going on? And in all honesty, the fact that we have not, and I'm grateful for this, and I hope it stays this way, but we haven't technically put boots on the ground. Yep. But there are a lot of people, I think, who, some of whom have great intentions, who call for certain things and actions that are full-blown, crazy acts of war that would require us to go put our people on the ground? What do what do guys like you, or just speak for yourself? Like, mm -hmm. what what do you what goes through your head when you see that, knowing the realities? There's uh, two points that I feel about. It. First is I'm just sad at the lives that are lost. Obviously, the innocent people that are losing their lives every day, the innocent men, women, and children that have died because of Russian aggression in the region. Um, but beyond that, I am sad that America has lost influence to the point where we used to be in a place geopolitically where we could stop that from occurring in the first place because of the overwhelming force and might of the American military. Mm. Meaning, okay, the term Pax Americana, I don't know if you've ever heard yes, this term before. Yes. It's the idea that, hey, we don't invade nations in seeking territorial gain or conquest post-World War II because if that happens, America will come to your shoreline and put a stop to it. That is not the case anymore. 
we are now living in a world where Russia has invaded the Ukraine for exactly that, seeking territorial gain, and there are not American forces on the ground stopping that from even occurring. So is it a big ask to ask American young service members to go and die in a nation that is not theirs? Yes, absolutely. However, I think on a long enough timeline, the world is a safer place because uh, America has the might to stop it from even occurring. So you would, you would send people. I there. have long said I have supported Americans being prevalent in the region because on a, on a longer timeline it would save more lives, and that's a big ask for the American people. But to give an example, post World War II, the world has been more at peace than it has ever been. And that is because America has been in the, the leading position from a geopolitical perspective to even patrol the seas in the first place, make sure trade happens accordingly. Um, to be honest, make sure trade happens in a way that is beneficial to us, because obviously we, we want the world to go in the direction that we want it to go in. But democratic values, the idea of people being more free than they ever have been, more safe than they ever have been, that has been the case post-World post War II because of the Allied victory. We are now, I feel, in the transition period of that, where mm. world leaders are now challenging the American empire and the, the established norms that have been around since World War II. And you're seeing that now. You're seeing more Chinese aggression from all the, yes. the Chinese assets that are overhead that were now being spied on. Um, you're seeing that from a Russian perspective with this whole Ukraine situation. Yeah. I think the cage is being shook a little bit. And um, the world is looking at America to see what our response is going to be to it. Did you happen to see Jack Murphy's report on the sleeper cell missions occurring in Russia? No, I have not. It flew under the radar a little bit because he he was supposed to be reporting it with a major, let's say, news outlet. He got very uncomfortable with some of the interference, let's call it, from... Mm -hmm aspects of the government in trying to get this out so he ended up reporting it on his own but it's an amazing report that people should read he's the host of one of the two hosts of the team house podcast which covers like a lot of geopolitical stuff through like the lens of like cia and some of the other agencies and the military because mm -hmm. he had a military background but my friend danny actually brought him on the show on on concrete and he walked people through what this was and it's just what you just said there is making me think of this because you're talking about pax americana as the u.s military coming to your border to mm -hmm. in reinforce this or something like that and we can get really deep on this so let's do it but i bring up his report because i think if you look at afghanistan post 9 11 actually okay. right after that's where warfare and how we carry that out in some ways change forever because yes did we send the military here? there absolutely but who was running that the cia paramilitary on okay. the ground was doing it and you had like badass black ops officers in little teeny clusters like going out into the country with big bags of cash whatever mm -hmm. you need getting the people that they need on their side and kind of destroying the taliban from within and it was excellent like i had said earlier for a while Jack Murphy's report, to loop that in, basically said that the United States had set up the, the CIA in conjunction with another intelligence service in Europe who he did not name. He made the election not to do that. Had set up literal sleeper cells in okay. like the late 2000s. So this is straight out of this. They need to make a movie out of this. But you've seen like those bombings on the bridges and stuff and mm -hmm. in some of the buildings in Russia, like where they make shit or government buildings. That is the CIA pulling off some fucking amazing shit, if I may say. I know yep. they don't like the people who found out about that. That's kind of the idea for part of it. But like, it's great work where they have been sabotaging from the other side of the border without putting our troops on the border per se. Sure. They've been sabotaging the Russian effort. And these sleeper cells, it's fucking crazy, man. They, they would be various people. I It sounds to me like they'd be regular Russian people who mm -hmm. they recruited as well as some foreigners who they sent in there and they don't do anything. So let's say they sent them there in like 09, 2010. These people know their mission and they are literally a sleeper cell, meaning they go about their life. They have their business. They have no communication with intelligence services. They have bombs buried in random fucking coordinates in right. the woods. And the minute they get some Morse code signal, which they got in 2022 at some point, they don't have to be told anything and they go there and they fucking take care of business. And so when you're talking about 
putting the the boots on the ground, it seems to me on the basis of the fact that, yes, this is a terrible war that's going on and I'd like to see it come to a close here. And I agree that obviously Putin's a horrible guy and what he's done is kind of unfathomable. But you see that we have managed to help between funding, which people have questions about that. That's fair. But with some of the intelligence operations where we are effectively doing this with some covert nature and Putin hasn't taken over Ukraine, which people thought he was going to take in like two days. So does that, if you, I guess the overall question is, I wanted to give the full context so you could actually play with it, but is that kind of accomplishing what you'd like to see accomplish if that ends up working in the long run here? Okay. Uh, The military term with this is anytime you take an effect or anytime you make a decision point, you have primary effects that occur directly after whatever mission you take place. Then you have what are called secondary and tertiary effects, meaning effects that don't take into effect immediately, but maybe a year or two or decades after. An example of this specific to Afghanistan was when the Russians or the USSR at the time was in Afghanistan, we were funding direct paramilitary groups that at the time we were calling freedom fighters to shoot at the Russians. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yes. So I'm going to fund these groups directly, give them arms and equipment and training, and in many cases, American support to shoot at the Russians because we cannot shoot at them directly because then the whole balloon goes up. Then World War III kicks off, right? Okay. So that works out in our favor in in the 1980s when this is occurring. What happens 20 years later? Bin Laden. (laughs) When those same paramilitary groups all of a sudden go, hey, I have all this training and equipment now. Now I'm not a fan of the Americans anymore. We're going to hop in some airplanes and do some damage to these colonialists. So when it's Americans that are the ones that are solving the issues and it's the American lives and treasure that are being spent, the best desired end state occurs. And that's a big ask of the American public. But if you look at World War II, the reason why uh, Germany and Japan and even Korea following directly after World War II happened in the best way possible was because you had American intervention and American conventional forces and an American mission driving an American end state. Do you view the potential of, let's say, the threat of just Russia? Leave China out of it for a second, okay? And I know that there's ties there and everything, but let's just focus on Russia because that's technically, you know, they're the ones doing the war in Ukraine. Do you view the burgeoning threat of that, like say they take a piece of Ukraine, just a piece of it, is it on the same wavelength for you as like the rise of Hitler in the 1930s? I see the parallels and more than that, I am scared of the precedent that it sets. So if we as a Mm. world say, okay, it's okay to invade countries and take territory, Taiwan is next. And there are normal people there that have normal lives and are good people that are worried about their lives and their safety. And there's this domino effect that I feel will take place if we as a world and as a nation say, okay, we're going to give this little sliver of the Ukraine to the Russians and they'll stop. In the same way that we said to Hitler, hey, if you take this little sliver of this particular country, you'll stop after this. We'll, we'll impose this policy of appeasement. He'll stop after he has th- these, these tiny pieces of territory. And he didn't. And it ultimately led into the world war. Yeah. One of the things that I don't really buy in this argument is when people try to blame the whole thing on NATO and they try to say like, oh, well, we were being careless on his borders and putting shit there, which I'm not saying there wasn't carelessness. There Mm -hmm. definitely was. But it's like there's a huge difference between having a few ever so slightly aggressive postures and then someone invading an entire sovereign nation. Right. Like those are two very different things to me. And so while there were communication fuck ups and carelessness and things like that, I, I just, I I cannot for the life of me understand why Putin would do this because it, it, it is, it is the catalyst event that has really now cut off the East from the West. Because now, as you just said yourself, People are tying in China to this and the precedents. And we see that China and Russia, you know, they're 
trying not to be overly public about it, but you know, they're right next to each other. Sure. Some oil going back and forth, some other shit. And now you have the West all kind of lining up saying, ooh, let's draw the Iron Curtain line around those countries and you potentially are going to have a way bigger problem. Knock on wood, hope that doesn't sure. happen. So when I hear your precedent argument, I understand it. And there's a lot of people right now who are going to be in the YouTube comments like, fuck this guy, military sure. industrial complex, whatever. I, I appreciate mm -hmm. you. You're, you're calling it as you see it and you don't have an agenda with this. I get mm -hmm. that. But you also have talked with me on the phone a little bit when mm -hmm. we were talking like a month ago. You had mentioned that you do look at the military industrial complex and that there's some things where, and correct me if I'm paraphrasing you wrong here but there's some things where it's like yeah why the fuck do we do that or why why are we constantly cycling to do mm -hmm. this this or that and basically making full industries out of this despite the fact that you're you're from the industry and like sure. you enjoyed your time like how do you balance that with constantly finding the latest war and saying well if we don't do it it's sure. going to be a precedent so uh I have a unique perspective with this because I have been on both sides of the military and industrial complex. I've been in the military and I've been a defense contractor as well. So I've seen what both sides of this, this machine tends to be. And I think uh, it's very easy to make a 10 minute YouTube video about what this thing actually is, but actually living in it, it has given me an interesting perspective to how the inner workings of it actually function. So uh, what I have seen from, we'll take the tech piece specifically, a lot of the world changing technologies that make our way into our lives a lot of the time an overwhelming majority of the time those technologies start as military technologies i'll give an example gps mm. technologies is, is a phenomenal example of this during the gulf war during the invasion of the gulf in, in the early 90s gps technology uh was a military application that allowed allied forces or u.s military forces to navigate and maneuver uh in sandstorms so the GIs that were deployed there, the sandstorms that were apparent during their convoys, they were so thick that they could put out their hands and they couldn't see in front of them, yeah. but we could still fire and maneuver with whatever tanks or convoys we were running at the time. That was coming from a military system of satellites where assets on the ground would talk to those satellites and mm. give you a GPS map that would show you where to drive. So the application started from a military need. Once the military need was accomplished, it then trickled its way down into the civilian sector. I have seen that pattern over and over and over again. So I think the military funds uh, the military with uh, the, the funding package that it does from a protection standpoint, but it also is from an investment standpoint as well. Another example of this would be, we'll take my jobs specifically the network en engineering or enterprise grade networking, how the internet works as a whole started as a military technology. We had interconnected ballistic missile silos that all had to talk and share and communicate information between one another. So the U S government funded a bunch of really smart people to ve develop a system where all these remote sites could talk and share and communicate with one another. That became the framework for the internet. You see this pattern over and over again from GPS to satellites, to radios, to um, any groundbreaking AI technology, a lot of it is funded by the military or by the DOD in the first place. So do you think, th this is a really interesting, I'm not sure if I've heard someone articulate it down to this exact mm -hmm. logical reason, but are you saying that if we didn't have the desperation that like national security or needs desire and therefore also i mean let's call it what it is when you're in the government and you're working high up mm -hmm. at the cia or something and you call up steve jobs and say steve we got guys out in afghanistan right. who have a problem steve's gonna want to help right mm -hmm. he's gonna put his best people on and wants to keep the government happy are you saying that if we didn't have that trickle down system where it actually has some honesty to it as well because mm -hmm. people do want to help we would not have the desperation of the innovation that then drives the broad innovations that we all enjoy today later than, say, the government had it. War drives innovation. It always has. Oh, boy. So <laughs> another example of this would be just the idea that all these systems, they, they came from the military because the need was more pressing for it almost immediately. Hey, uh, it's American Joes that are dying right now. This problem has to get solved yesterday. Once that need is met and fixed, it then makes its way into the civilian market. I've seen that pattern over and over and over again. Can we take a silo on this real quick? Of course. How much technology exists 
that we have no fucking idea about that's beyond our wildest imaginations right now. The I never worked in this agency. I've just heard about it. The Allegedly. Ag the the <laughs> ag agency that you're talking about is DARPA. Uh -huh. DARPA funds uh, crazy ideas and has American tax dollar support behind it to create big groundbreaking uh, technological innovations from a military perspective or a military application. Um, of those ideas, like anything, 99% of them turn out to not even be, in, be compatible in the first place, 1% make it to market. And the reason why the military industrial complex exists in the first place is because often the military and the government can't pay to hire the best engineers to design these products in the first place. So the best way to look at this is to understand anything. You have to understand the money behind it. If you view all the things I'm talking about, the tanks, the C-130s, the, the satellite systems, if you view them as products that are sold to the U.S. government, this starts making a lot more sense. So the U.S. government will never be able to hire the best people and pay them the best salaries to design all this stuff. We need to hire guys like Steve Jobs who have the payroll to pay the really smart people to build these systems. Once they're built, they can then be sold to the U.S. government and the, the maintenance and troubleshooting and support can be sold with them. So the reason why all these big defense contractor companies exist in the first place, the, the Raytheons, the L3 Harris, the Boeings, they sell products to the U.S. government and oftentimes those products have a military application first, give it 10 or 20 years, they'll be in your pocket. So 10 or 20, but that's the thing, like... You can only concept what you know, mm -hmm. right? So I know an iPhone. I know a nice MacBook with 64 RAM sure. on it, right? It, what though, you know what? Here's a good example. What about that guy, David Fravor? You and I were talking about that very briefly before we were on camera today. He's the one who, he's the Navy fighter pilot who not only witnessed but provided evidence for it, took the radar satellite images of the Tic Tacs, the little crafts that were flying around mm -hmm. his 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 jet that were making motions that are not of the universe that we know. Sure. And what I really like about that guy is he's so like, here's the here's the thing I was looking at, here's what I saw, you tell me. And he's like, seems like it's not from this universe, but hypothetically it also could be, you know, some form of crazy, I guess, technology we don't know about. If that's the case that technology, I mean, I don't know how to put years on it, to be honest, but that seems fucking 100 years ahead. I've never seen anything like it. And what's crazy about him is he is a trained observer. He's yeah. a naval aviator who um, has years of aviation experience and millions of dollars worth of training put into him through the DOD and through, through the Navy specifically. And when that guy is saying, I don't know, or I have never seen anything that looks remotely close to our capabilities as a nation, it makes me wonder, wow. I don't know if there's a human element that's behind that or if that really is UFOs or some extraterrestrial force that we are seeing unfold yeah. in front of us. And when we were kind of joking about it, when it's not a redneck in the woods with an iPhone saying, hey, <laughs> look at what I saw. When it's a Navy pilot saying, hey, I saw some shit and I don't know what it is exactly. It makes you wonder what it is. Yeah. Yeah, and I think some of those questions, unfortunately, I hope I'm wrong. I don't know if we'll ever get answered, but you know, you mentioned DARPA mm -hmm. and the kind of shit that they do over there. That's that is an an agency that I know so little about. Yep. You know, I haven't sat there and read the long books on it or anything. It's it's a very new territory for me. I know I guess more about the CIA, but there's a lot I don't know there, obviously. But when you look at what their resource resources are at DARPA. Like, do you have any idea, for example, like how big they are? Like any idea how many people are in that? No. It's kind of putting you on the spot. But. I, I know they have a lot of funding and I know they have really smart people working for them. And the reason for that, at least I feel, um, is because the reason why the US military has the capabilities that it does is because we, at the end of the day, are the ones that are the pioneers of these weapon systems. All the groundbreaking technology, hopefully, comes from us first. So if we're the ones that are driving the innovation, we're the ones that get the, the capability that comes along with it first, we're the ones that, that have the ability to employ those weapon systems against our enemies, we will always have an advantage. And what I have seen that's scaring me, we talked about the changing geopolitics that are occurring. The gap between the United States from a military capabilities perspective and the gap between our near peer threats that we are talking about, Russia, China, 
that gap is closing. Really? Well, the gap is closing because um, those near peer threats are taking risks that they wouldn't take previously. How so? Look at the the war in the Ukraine. Oh, you're saying, but that's a tactical risk. You're talking about capabilities, though. So the Chinese, in my opinion, were we're in a cold war with them right now. Yeah, but they're, th this is the one thing that makes me feel good about China, mm -hmm. talking with a lot of other military guys. Yep. Maybe you know some stuff that I haven't heard sure. from other guys because I'm just hearing it mm -hmm. secondhand, but like China's military sucks, apparently. Sure. And like a, a perfect like example. garbage. A perfect example of this is, okay, when we want to collect on a near peer threat, we'll toss up a $40 million asset that you can't even see with the naked eye or a really powerful telescope and collect intelligence on you. Like a balloon. When they want to collect on us, they toss up a weather balloon with some cameras duct taped to it. Oh, they do it, right. So right. There's, obviously there's a disparity. But the Chinese model is, hey, we're going to steal all the IP information yes. from the United States. We're going to make uh, our cruddy version of it and try to employ it against the United States. But if, if China continues to advance in the direction that it's advancing in from an economic standpoint where the gap between the United States and the Chinese economically is closing, it creates uh, challenges for the United States. Because what drives the innovation with all the things we're talking about is dollars and cents, is money. Of course. Of course. If, if we don't have the resources and the money to even budget to the giant defense budget that the United States has, um, if China has more has deeper pockets than us, it drives all the innovation that we're talking about. Well, that's the thing that they do that scares me that they do, unfortunately, a great job right now of is influencing countries around the world by buying up their ports and stuff. Right. They are phenomenal at economic influence and they just cheat with all their money to, I mean, I'm way oversimplifying it right now, sure. so don't yell at me, but you know, they're able to cheat with their currency and shit to be able to just fund shit that they know countries are never going to be able to pay back and then own them, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they've done it. We've looked at it on podcasts. They've done it all over the place and, and it is a concern, but like, this is the same country though, where you know, for all the complaints people want to bitch about here, whether you're left or right and you just want to fight about stuff, at the end of the day, like, we have and enjoy the best freedoms in the world. I mean, it's an amazing place and, you know, we got to stop fighting so much. Agreed. But, you know, there's there's a lot of good right now. We're, we're having a tough moment politically, but there's a lot of good. When you look at China that has whatever it is, 1.3, 1.4 billion people, a lot of them are starving. Yep. The Chinese government, and this needs, people don't say this enough. There is only, I think it's, I hope I remember the number correctly, correctly so correct me in the comments. If it's wrong, I'll check it in a minute. But something like 6.9% of the country, that's it, is a member of the Communist Party, mm -hmm. right? So you were talking about a minority of people who are holding fist power over everybody else. And you see a lot of these poor Chinese people who are, who are living in these crowded cities and stuff. They have no money or they live out and they work horrible long day jobs and they have no freedoms. You know, they don't have some of the, say, even comfort that we have here. They, they don't enjoy that. And so you have a government now that's facing some problems that like that guy Peter Zahan points out with demographics where people, you know, they're not having kids. Yep. And you have a lot of people who... You know, you may have that big population, but only a portion of it is contributing to things. So, for example, and the reason I started this little tangent is because when you look at their military, some of the people they're filling this out with, they want nothing to do with it. They don't have the patriotic sense that you did because they fucking hate what this shit stands for. I saw something the other day, and please verify this one as well, but they had to install bombs, I guess you call it, inside the helmets of Chinese pilots that the people on the ground, the generals control because too many of them were fucking flying somewhere else and like getting the fuck out of China. Sure. I mean, that's not like, I have maps behind you. If you mm -hmm. look, I'll put it in the corner of the screen. Just, this is very quickly. I just Googled this. So other people, again, please Google stuff like this, check stuff like this, but like Chinese military bases around the world. Yeah, there's a few. Now look at the US military bases around the world. There's fucking... I don't even know how many that is. You know what I mean? So when I see this, I like that. I'm like, Agreed. you know, this is, I can complain about the military industrial complex, but from a safety perspective, I'm like, okay, all right, we're, we're doing all right. Here's the part that worries me about that. 20 years ago, there were no dots on that map. For China. For China. Yeah, no, that's fair. 
That's a fair word. So like, okay, <clears throat> I've long been called the bullish optimist in the room. Um, my perspective with this is I think the CCP might be the greatest thing to happen to the United States in recent decades. Mm. And what I mean by that is, okay, uh, America tends to come together when there is some sort of common enemy that we can all rally behind. And I think it might just be the great uniter that unites the country. An example of that is, okay, from a political perspective, uh, I would describe myself as, as just right of center. Um, a conservative libertarian is a very good way of describing me. Um, <clears throat> however, if I uh, am talking or hold a conversation with a person who has uh, extremely liberal views or prioritizes things like gender equality and uh, liberty for everybody or classical liberal values, if that person uh, has daughters or grandchildren, you would hope that they live in a world where America is always the leading force behind that world. Because in China, no one has rights, least of all the women. Yeah. We want to make sure that the world lives, that we share a world where, that values things like democracy, liberty, gender equality, fairness and equitable resources for almost everybody. Those are values that America falls short of in many cases, but we're attempting to provide those values to everybody in the first place. Places like China and places like Russia don't care about any of those things. So if your problem is with the United States having the military industrial complex or the reach and influence that the American military has, the reason why we get to enjoy all the wonderful things that you just listed off is because of the safety that the American military provides. And if we don't have that framework established, one of my favorite quotes is power is never uh, created or destroyed. It is only transferred. There's a finite mm -hmm. amount of power. If we lose influence in the world, our near peer threats, China and Russia start gaining power and influence. And in their culture, all the things that are very important to more liberal minded people are not at all a priority to those, those nations. I think, and, and I'm trying to pull up some of that data that I was talking about. So again, check me in the comments on that. But this this is like the ultimate conundrum you bring up. Mm -hmm. Because, and, and I, I hear you. I mean, you heard me say at the end of that, I was like, hey, I kind of like this, that, that we have that. But I'm also then saying like, oh, I love the military industrial complex, which I don't. Sure. You know, and it's, it's one of those situations where there's a psychological paradox. The people who profit off of that mm -hmm. and are part of it if you want to call it all the way maybe like the war machine or something like that sure. they can sit there and say oh you enjoy all this stuff because we have it that's why we need it you're going to be on un un if 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 you speak against it mm -hmm. to then continue to enable all the extra shit that they do because no one ever lives here in the middle they either live here or here you know zero or a hundred and so they get to keep going a hundred but if you then say, oh, don't get involved at all, pull off, be an isolationist, which I'm not for at all. Sure. Well, now you're at zero and now we're fucked, mm -hmm. right? Because now there's none of those values are going anywhere in the world and you are separating from the world. So it's it constantly feels like a situation to me. Like I truly believe in, I talk about all the time, in the concept of the law of physics, which is law in that world. But I think it's a law for everything else where it says for every action, there's an equal but opposite reaction. And it goes to show you the answer lies in the middle on most of these things. Like I want to go 50 miles an hour, not zero or 100, but no one wants to go 50 because it's not the fun, exciting thing to do. It's not the thing people can fight about. And so when we get into these conversations, you're such a level-headed guy. Mm -hmm. That's why I appreciate it. Of course. You know, there's a lot of people who have to pound the table with shit. And you're just saying, look, this is how I see it. This is what it is. And so like if there's going to be people who maybe lean one way on mm -hmm. that, as you do for some things at least, well – I would appreciate it if it's more people like you having that conversation rather than some of the shit I do when I see when I turn on sure. TV, you know? Well, like, okay, we talked about, hey, I saw what the reality of the military industrial complex is. That map that you just pulled up, all those US military bases. If we wanna continue to have that kind of support, I see two options. Um, from a military perspective, if you wanna remove the private industry that's associated with it, you need to have a service model that is akin to that of South Korea where you have a mandatory mandatory conscription, where every military age male is forced to serve in the military to support this. Because the American military has needs and manpower needs and funding needs that are not apparent of that of other nations because of this map that you just pulled up. Obviously not a very popular political platform to run on. You're, it's gonna be hard to garner votes if that is your strategy. 
what the military industrial complex or the defense sector does, in my opinion, a whole lot better is it puts private people uh, in places to fill that gap. So instead of taking a kid who's 18 and forcing him to enlist in the military for a period of time, you can pay defense contractors. You can pay people who were in the military, got out, and have the training and logistics and desire mm. to support this in the first place. But because it's private, you have to pay them. So I see two options. I see we either go away with private industry to begin with, and you just force everybody to serve, um, or you allow the military industrial complex to exist. And unfortunately, people kind of have to get paid along with that process. That is true. And I think that's a big part of it in the sense that it's to me, and this is just me reading between the lines, listening to people like sure. you talk who have lived it. So take it for a big grain of salt, what it's worth. But the private sector that's been created of this which is quite literally where the term military industrial complex comes from is just an economic incentive for the best talent to be able to continue to serve and not officially be paid by the government so it's not like you know an employee of the cia is making two million dollars a year and right. taxpayers can complain but there's a big funnel of money right like mm -hmm. a big billions of dollars is just a part of a budget and that budget includes people who are being paid millions of dollars by the government to go do stuff that's how you have guys like eric prince running blackwater and sure. making hundreds of millions of dollars and stuff yep he's not employed by the government but you know he's a big part of it working on the behalf yeah so when i see things like that i get it but i also get why people then look at that as as a dirty pool and beyond that though you had a line in there about five six minutes ago i think that really rings in my head because it i understand why people say it but it makes me nervous and i believe it was we need a common enemy or yep. something like that okay what well, first what did you mean like if you could define that completely because you mm -hmm. brought it up in the context of china sure when you say common enemy with them with and you mentioned we're like maybe in a cold war with them do you view that as we need to be able to have someone that we all can or some place that we all can rally behind in this country to not like as a whole and then potentially have some sort of military conflict where we are victorious or am i pushing that nope. way too far i think it touches on, on a lot of things the first thing that it touches on and i think is the people in this country are ultimately humans and human beings are tribal by nature I feel, I think it's very human yeah. to say, hey, we're in this camp, they're in that camp. It feels very good to feel very strong in our camp. I think regardless of what nation that you'll establish, that will always be uh, a factor that we have to determine. Beyond that, um, I was not around for 9-11. I was in pre-K uh, when it happened, so I have no memories of it. But I have heard people who did live through it talk about the atrocities of 9-11, but how incredible 9-12 felt all the time yeah. and how immediately the same political divisiveness that is apparent now stopped in a day and i hear the type of support and read history books about how people were growing um war gardens in their in their backyards during world war ii because we were shipping all the canned goods to guys overseas so we had to limit the amount of canned goods that that average american consumers were buying because of the war effort i think unfortunately what what would bring this country together tomorrow is a common enemy that we can all say, hey, despite our differences, if we aren't victorious, they're going to be. And if I want to have daughters that share an equitable world, that have the same rights as men do, we have to make sure that America and American values are apparent in that world. And I know coming from a defense contractor, that sounds really biased. Not popular. Because it is. <laughs> okay? But... I, that more than that, it's coming from a patriotic American, and that's coming from a person with my family history, and that's coming from a person who just sees the good that this nation has done. And I, what I think these things are that we're talking about, they're tools that the American government as a whole uses to accomplish all the things we're talking about. But you throw political corruption and human greed and just human bias and our flaws as men on top of it, and it gets messy. It gets very messy. No, it's 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 a it's a scary slippery slope, and we're already down the slope. But you know, how far down do you go? the 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 benefit of doing what I do, one of my favorite parts about this, is the fact that I always have like a different person across sure. from me, and I have people from all different types of backgrounds, political affiliations, and whatever. But 
there, you, you start to come up with some patterns. Mm -hmm. You know, we're on 140 something at this point with sure. this. And, you know, I, th there's a line that Andy Bustamante had the second time I had him in here that went under the radar. Of all the things that people talk about in the comments with that guy in his comment sections are hilarious. You know, people just claiming this and claiming that. I, I don't even know if I saw a comment on this thing he said, but it was exactly what you did. And he said, like you created an enemy where we didn't need to have one. And so now you're saying that. So do you understand why people would judge that when they hear that? Yeah, so what I'm saying is not exactly what you're saying. What I'm okay. saying is we will, the world, when the world doesn't have an enemy, it gets lost. When human beings don't have something to rally against, they start finding things to rally against. So they just, they subdivide and they subdivide again and they start, they, they argue about whatever. They argue everything from buy local to, you know, you're a bad person if you hang this sign and you don't hang that sign or whatever it might be. They, they find reasons to subdivide. The only way that we all ditch all these subdivisions is when we unify behind one large enemy. And he was saying the same thing you did. And to borrow his phrase from another podcast, he said, he's like, I'm not allowed to say where I was stationed, but I'm allowed to say it was an Asian and it was in Asia and I speak Chinese and Thai. So you do the math. Right. Right. So this guy gets that part of the world. And so I hear that and I don't even have to put on a tinfoil hat, nor do I have to do it with you to be like, okay, well, that's interesting. Now that's at least a couple guys who have publicly in my parents' house in New Jersey talked mm -hmm. on a mic that goes on the internet to sure. a lot of people to see about, you know, this concept that we're going to, it's like you're talking it into existence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want world peace. But, sure. you know, I also, I'd like to marry the fucking head Victoria's Secret model. Wouldn't we all? I may not get that, right? right? <laughs> so it's not like there's things that are, that are that are actually attainable that we want, but I'd like to see less conflict than more. And when I hear things like this, I kind of wonder if there is these patterns of turning up the heat on purpose. I mean, shit, a year ago, you couldn't, China was one of those things like, oh, you didn't really talk about that. Now the whole mainstream media is talking sure. about it like crazy. And I start to wonder, I'm like, oh, am I missing something here? Or is this exactly what they're doing? Okay. I would look to history for another example of this. I often, okay. I'm a little bit of a history nerd. I tend, I try to read about things that have happened in the in the past and find patterns in those events. So, uh, a perspective that I like to place myself in the perspective of is uh, a veteran after the Second World War. So, specifically, a veteran after the Second World War during the '60s. This is a person who many cases was forced to go to Europe and forced to see his friends die because yeah. of the circumstances that were happening. He then comes home and sees America, depending on who you talk to, quote unquote, fall apart. You see the Nixon administration, you see Watergate, you have Vietnam occur, you have um, the civil rights movement occur, you have... Uh, but it, that it, was positive. It was positive, but the amount of political divisiveness that was occurring during that time in America was more politically divisive, I would argue, than we are now. America was being pulled at the seams in two very polarizing directions. And thankfully, history f like went in the direction of, hey, we need to give more rights to more people, as it should have been. But the political divisiveness that was apparent in that time frame, I don't think we have seen until now. The 60s was just a very uh, tumultuous time for America. They were posting guards outside of national memorials at the time yeah. because of how unpatriotic the public was. So to, to see that as a World War II veteran, I would think, oh, everything that I just fought for and sacrificed for and gave my life for is falling apart in front of me. Look at the youth of America. They don't even appreciate what's happening today. Around the corner of that was the 80s. Around the corner of that was the fall of the USSR. Around the corner of that was the fall of the Berlin Wall. So even though you had the Kennedy assassination, even though you had Dr. King being assassinated, even though you had all these horrible things that were happening in America, America was turning a corner into this era of prosperity that we are now on the coattails on. And I think the same pattern in history is occurring right now. And what unfortunately 
is the catalyst that causes that to happen is some sort of big political militaristic force that's pushing the United States into a place where it has to make those choices. And that force in this case is the CCP. And they're doing it, in my opinion, because they're challenging the status quo. They are a nation state like we are a nation state. And they don't like the idea that they're number two. What do you, when you say that, mm -hmm. when you're talking about nation state in the context of them, what do you mean by that? So uh, the status quo that has been around since World War II is, hey, we lead the world. America is the driving force that makes sure things happen in accordance with not only what America wants to happen for the world, but just Western doctrine. NATO is roped into this specifically. Russia and China are on the opposite end of that spectrum. So what's interesting about these nation states is they have the, the interesting political situation where we think in four-year election cycles, they can have plans that unravel in, in terms of decades. Mm -hmm. So they can choose very specifically when to execute on certain large grandiose plans that they've had in place for possibly decades. I find it very interesting that a lot of these things are happening during the time that they are now, from the war in the Ukraine to um, certain mil military intervention in the country, what we're seeing with all these war balloons. Um, I think a lot of a lot of the time these these nation states just want to cause chaos in the United States because it causes infighting. And just, of just like I was talking about, we, when we're fighting amongst one another, it's distracting from the real problems that are occurring overseas. Agree completely. And I think that there, that things that are, that work their way organically. And I will use that word here mm -hmm. organically into our, public forums, be it through the media, be it through the people expressing their opinions online, all of it, I view it the same in, in this respect. I think it emanates from other places. I don't think that. I know that if you look at the data, right? Sure. The smarter people than me are out there measuring this shit, and the internet's a powerful tool. It is coming, a lot of it, from other places, and it continues to then create fights where there don't need to be one. Yep. And I think there are a lot of people who feel a similar way to how I do, which is just like, I don't fucking care about all this shit people are fighting about online. Mm -hmm. Like it's, your fight really ain't gonna make a difference. You know what I mean? Like people are gonna do what they're gonna do. Like, who the fuck cares? You know what I mean? Sure. And we start getting lost in the things that don't matter. And then perhaps we even ignore the important conversations, not perhaps, we definitely ignore the important conversations that have to happen that may even end up going against some of the things that you hope to see sure. from your seat, right? But I would love it if people would actually like try to figure out what is going on in the East right now, mm -hmm. you know, and, and not just read the headline on it and, and try to try to learn things that aren't just two minute sound bites on fucking TV that then get replayed on Twitter. But that's not really the world that most people live in, you know? And it's like, I'm not going to change that. Sure. You're not going to change that. Nope. So is that a reality we just got to deal with and build that into the equation forever now? So you've talked about this with other guests. Bustamante is a phenomenal example of this. He has argued, and I would argue as well, that the American public at the end of the day is not going to care about the geopolitical state in all the places that we're talking about. Right. They don't care about the, the political affiliation or the political goals of the CCP or China or Russia. People care about what is immediately going on in their life. So in my opinion, what has to occur is we need to make sure that we have governmental agencies and money and resources dedicated to people who think about this all day long. Because if we don't, those problems will come to our doorstep. And all of a sudden, average normal people who would never have China even enter their mind have to deal with it because they're pair dropping into the country. The, the, the agencies, the CIA, the FBI, the military industrial complex, all these, all these things are tools that the United States government use to stop that from even occurring. And the average normal person can't, can't enjoy the freedoms and the wonderful things that America has if we have bigger problems. And that's, that's actually, I mean, a line I'd like to say, and I'm sure people said it before me, but I thought I came up with it was, <laughs> we have never been invaded yep. and it really shows. I've heard you, know? you say this before. And I think it's also, technically we were kind of invaded for the War of 1812 and of course the American Revolution was already, like it was an invasion, they were here. Mm -hmm. But, you know, since then, generations don't know what that is. But you also brought up about 
how people recognize realities in the past. Yeah, I love that you brought up the World War II stuff with how people here who didn't go over there pitched in. And you're on the East Coast for the first time in your life sure. today. Welcome, by the way. Appreciate it. But one of the things they did here that I was unaware of until I think John Schneider talked about in episode 32, but on the East Coast around New York and in New Jersey especially, but also up in like, I think it was Massachusetts and stuff, but check me on this people would turn their lights off at night to support the, the shore effort. towns would not these people would turn off their electricity and turn in for the night at fucking seven o'clock why because there were german u-boats out there sure. and they didn't want there to be any problem or invasion or attacks or something like that so those people who had lived through generations and generations and did not know invasion still had the understanding to be like, oh, this is a real serious threat and let's band together on this. And not that I want people like it scares me when when people like you and a lot of people say like, oh, my God, would it take something like a 9-11 to uh, to get people's attentions again? I, I don't want to see that. No I do does. not want to see that. That's horrible. And like avoid that at all costs. But I do want to see people at least recognize that things like that could happen. And you have to act accordingly and stop fighting over a TikTok. You know what I mean? Like, it's just getting so ridiculous out there. And it's not like I expect 15-year-olds to understand this. But at some point, turn the corner. You know, when you're 20, you recognize, like, okay, you know, we got a society here. It's a complicated world. We got to figure some shit out. And stop stop just thinking about yourself on all this. Think about sure. the higher calling. Think, I mean, you were 18 and you wanted to serve the country, right? There's a lot of people like you. So there's some people who are thinking like that. I think there's something to be said about the silent majority in this country. And ultimately what has happened, in my opinion, is I think because of all the wonderful innovations that we have from technology, the people uh, who are the loudest, when everybody has a megaphone, they're screaming loudest yeah. into that megaphone. And if you don't believe me, go on Twitter. Like there's, <laughs> there, there's lots of evidence of that. So I think a lot of the political discourse and political uh, just division that we have in this country, I think it has always been apparent, regardless of what time period you're looking at in American history. I think it's just in everybody's face right now because of uh, all this wonderful technology that we get to enjoy. And that's kind of what we try to do with the company. Um, for those that may not know. Oh, yeah. Let's do a quick silo no, on that. What do you got going on? So uh, I'm the founder and president of Send It Supplements. We make the world's first dippable pre-workout supplement. Um, I actually like a, di like a chew? Like a chew. So I'm sure you're familiar with pre-workout. I'm sure a lot of your listeners are as well. <clears throat> pre-workout normally comes in jars that you take little scoops and put into a shaker cup and shake up before you go to the gym. Ours is a little different. It comes in individual uh, packets filled with powder that you put in your lip, similar to chewing tobacco. The motto of the company is shaker cups suck because you don't need to use a shaker cup in order to use the product. And the mission of the company is to caffeinate as many hardworking Americans as possible. <laughs> it's not just for soldiers. It's for anybody that needs caffeine. To get and it, it works? Absolutely, it does. I was a C4 guy. That so, worked pretty well for me. So the reason why this might work a little better is because you have what are called mucous membranes in your nostril and in your lip. Um, it's also the reason why <clears throat> chewing tobacco tends to work a little better than smoking a cigarette. You get a better nicotine kick from it because the mucous membranes that you have in your uh, lips and nostril bring whatever substance you're putting in your body delivers it faster into the bloodstream. It's also the reason why cocaine works as well as it does because you're sniffing it directly into your body. Oh, yeah. We are hijacking the same delivery system, but instead of putting something horrible in your body like chewing tobacco or cocaine, we put caffeine. So there's no there's no cocaine in this? No, unfortunately not. The okay. FDA is pretty strict about you're, that you're one. You're all checked with the FDA? What there is though is there's 300 milligrams of caffeine per pouch along with a slew of vitamins that's delivered in each pouch How as much well. is that? Like, I never thought, I, I don't know the numbers with caffeine. Like, what's that the equivalent of? So a C4, a uh, scoop of pre-workout, is anywhere from 150 to 300 milligrams of caffeine, okay. depending on what strength you take. Uh, a cup of coffee is just under 100 milligrams of caffeine. A bang. How big is a cup of coffee? Eight ounces? Eight to 12 ounces. Okay. Um, uh, a bang or uh, a rain energy drink is also <laughs> 300 milligrams of caffeine. So what's so great about this product is instead of eight individual uh, big pieces of liquid that you have to lug around in, in your backpack, this fits in your pocket. Mm. It's also a little more convenient than remembering to wash a shaker cup or to uh, scoop pre-workout. In many cases, guys are dry scooping. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, where they'll actually take pre-workout and just take it without oh, water. I've done that. Yeah. yeah. This will work a whole lot better. Than work better than that. Cool. So the, 
the story of the company was I was actually in Syria of all places. And now this is when you're a defense contractor. This was when I was a defense contractor. And all right. Well, so, and by the way, I'll put the I'll put the website link in the description so mm -hmm. people can go get it. What is it? Send it supplements. Send it supplements. Uh, dot com. Send it subs. Dot com. Send it subs. S u p p s. P p s. Dot com. All right. We'll put that up there. But yeah. So you're in Syria and you come up with this. So. Um, at this point, I had a little bit of money saved up from what I was doing uh, as a defense contractor. Yeah, what were you making doing that? So I don't mind saying this, and this is by no means bragging. Um, I want to to give this figure because I want to show what is possible for all young E4s that are currently in the military right now. Young what? E4s, that is um, the rank of enlisted four and below. So in the Air Force, that's senior airmen. In the okay. Army, that could be a corporal, but you're lower enlisted. You're guys who joined right out of high school and got the four gimme ranks that are apparent in every military. The, the ranks that anybody can obtain. Um, I was making north of $350,000 a year <laughs> as a defense contractor. 350000 That money is not apparent anymore because the war isn't around, but I was making I both. see why you like the military industrial complex. <laughs> so <laughs> one of my favorite quotes is from Kevin Hart. And this kind of gets into my business philosophy. He said, um, I'm going to make all this money and I don't know exactly what I'm going to do with it right now, but I'm not smart or rather I'm not smart enough to figure out this real estate thing now, but I know at a later point I will be, and I'll finally have capital mm -hmm. to go on the attack with it. My mentality at the time was, Hey, I know that this money that I'm going to make, um, is not going to be long-term. I'm not going to make this for 20 years. This is an opportunity that I can take right now, and I'm going to take full advantage of it. Um, I just saved every penny that I could because I knew it was temporary. And I knew that I wanted to do something from a business perspective um, down the road, so I just saved every penny that I could. Good for you. When I got the idea for this, I got the name of the company, the logo, the slogan for the company, and the idea for the product all in the same go. And I knew immediately this is what I had to do. And over the course of the next, I think, three or four weeks um, from a satcom phone where you heard every other word and my MacBook laptop, I built a company from Syria. From where, where was it again in Syria that you were? Can't say specifically just because there's still- Oh, that was the one you can't, right? right. There are still Americans there. I don't mind right. talking to where I was at in Afghanistan, um, but Syria, there are still Americans on the ground at that particular Got installation. It. And that's that's really impressive. You were doing this there. So again, I'll, I'll put that link down in there. But how did you, you left Bagram in Afghanistan a couple months before before the pullout and then were you going to syria or had you already been there so when i was in afghanistan i spent a majority of my time in northern afghanistan specifically in a province called mazari sharif um it's mm -hmm. a, a very northern province in afghanistan and that fob was the big hop off point where i would touch all the cops or the combat outposts and the fire bases where all our remote right. satellites uh or our remote centers were found um <clears throat> after that i was slotted on this particular program to go to syria my next deployment doing the same thing that I was doing in Afghanistan, just in a different theater, because this particular company was selling this product to everybody. Um, along the way, the fall of Afghanistan happened. Okay, all right, now I got it straight. Yep. All right, you, you've been in a lot of places in a truncated time too. Yes. It's not like it was like 20 years, like there was, there was a lot going on. So for people out there mm -hmm. who constantly hear about Syria mm -hmm. and don't know it nearly as much as say Afghanistan or okay. Iraq, I, I had Joby Warwick in here two or three months ago, who's Pulitzer winner, amazing, amazing writer. The most fascinating terrorist figure I think I've ever come across. We're familiar with, with Bin Laden. Bin Laden and, and Zawahiri, then his number two guy, they were of a completely different type. These were people who were professionals. Uh, Bin Laden was an engineer. His number two was a medical physician, so they're educated, uh, sophisticated people. They have sort of a strategic vision of this terrorist organization they're trying to create. So Kali was none of that. He was just a street tough. We talked all about his book that won the Pulitzer Black Flags, which was all about ISIS. So some Syria came up and he started talking about some of the different sects that were forming in there in, say, around the time of ISIS. Okay. But 
his latest book we did not get to in that podcast and we're going to do a podcast on it in the future is all about Syria itself during the time period of the 2010s. It's incredible. I'll put that link somewhere as well, maybe in the description for people to check out. But for those at home who just hear about this guy Assad, maybe they've heard some shit on chemical weapons or whatever and like, yeah, there was some ISIS stuff that was going on there at some point. Like, what what is the critical importance of Syria in the United States' eyes, like the reason why we care about it at all sure. and what's going on, and and what is the lay of the land presently? So when I was there, um, this was during the Trump administration, and this is when you saw um, Trump's isolationist uh, perspectives that he had kind of trickle its way down into the foreign policy or the actual mm. actions that we took on the ground. Um, I was a observer as all this was happening. Again, I was not serving. I was just working with our customer who is in this case uh, an ODA team or a Green Beret team, meaning a special forces group that was yeah. assigned to this particular uh, region. So your customer is the United States government. Right. Yeah. So they would work, for those that are not familiar with what uh, special forces guys do, they work directly with partner force or local elements that are found in whatever region that we are operating in to work by, through, and with partner force to accomplish the goals of the United States. When they're there, quick question, mm -hmm. as a clarification, like the special forces guys, that's technically boots on the ground, but are they, in this case, more plain clothes and when working we, that way? When we were there, uh, there were no military uniforms worn. Uh, we were all in civilian attire. Um, you could tell that uh, a bunch of beefed up white dudes <laughs> at this particular compound are you don't say. <laughs> probably Americans and probably not Syrian. Um, but the the ops temple or the, the posturing of those elements are not as um, over the top or excuse me, not as pronounced as a normal conventional force would be. An example of this is anytime that we would run convoys, we were always in uh, Range Rovers and we were always in Toyota trucks and we were always in Land Cruisers. We were all, we were never almost always in uh, the MRABs or the big military looking vehicles that you could drive around and have a lot more protection involved in them. But um, it's very easy to spot, hey, those are Americans in full kit with their M4s. The whole point of uh, an ODA team is, hey, this is more of a, <clears throat> of a force that is used to use the partner force as a mechanism to accomplish the goals that the United States have. So instead of some 19-year-old from Arkansas dying in the desert, um, we can utilize and train and equip the local forces that are apparent in these regions to accomplish our goals. And mm. we're the term that, that these guys would use a lot is uh, we're going to do what's called combat advising. So this team would get dropped into this particular part of Syria, link up with the local forces and say, hey, at this time we are and still are going after ISIS personnel in this region. Hey, you guys have a common enemy with the United States. We're going to train you and equip you to kill these ISIS people because they're your enemy and they're our enemy. And this you're talking about when you were there. So this is... 2021 2022 this is still happening and what's the current because i'm gonna get some of these names wrong sure. but they had like the it was the al nusra front right that was the isis cell like in syria or something and then you had the regular i forget what they were called but like the regular rebels maybe they were backed by al-qaeda or something mm -hmm. against assad and then you had the assad regime and maybe there was one other in there today you know is it just like whatever's left of al nusra front my finger is no longer on the pulse of this just because I've been gone for so long now for a little over a year. <clears throat> so um, when you were there? When I was there, um, the ops tempo of Afghanistan was obvious, was surprisingly to me higher speed than it was in Syria for whatever reason. I, I heard all these war stories about how um, Syria is just very kinetic right now and you know we're running missions every night. When I got there, it was a lot more quiet just so happened to be in the cards when I was there. But um, I can't speak to directly what political groups were in power in the region at the time, uh, quite honestly, because I wasn't briefed on those programs. It wasn't a priority of mine. All I was worried about is, hey, this asset that we got overhead, can I make sure that we can see what the pilot is seeing? The people that I'm talking about though, the ODA teams that are directly there, they can speak to exactly, hey, these political groups and these uh, regional leaders that are apparent in this area, we work directly with them to train up local elements that are found in these forces to um, 
to disband ISIS groups that are found operating within these regions. And what I did see when I was there, though, is um, we kind of lump ISIS and the Taliban and Al Qaeda all into this big pool together. In many cases, um, the Taliban and Al Qaeda would try to hunt down and kill ISIS forces because even between them, yeah, they, they, they're, they like, they're a little crazy. They disagreed. <laughs> yeah. We would call that um, just enemy combatants killing other enemy combatants because even though they're all enemies of the United States, we found that their, their political disparities between even them were so far reaching that we were just trying to fund and equip and train almost anybody in that region that was an enemy of those forces. Of uh, both of them, both of them. Okay, all right. So I in be misheard there. in Syria specifically, <clears throat> uh, ISIS seemed to be the the leading um, force that was uh, committing all the atrocities. That unfortunately, during the Obama administration, was tr was finding its way into Europe. Uh, the reason yeah. why I think America spent so much time and military effort and resources into combating ISIS is because it terrorist attacks were occurring in Europe at a rate they hadn't previously, and the next next hop across the pond in my opinion would have been us yeah once it happens to white people they get upset sure kind of how it works but yeah i mean in in reality it's really scary how quick that blew up you know i and it's you know isis was technically goes back to alzacar and had been built for years but like the powder keg that formed in 2012 2013 to get them to where they were in 2014 sure. it's wild to me and like syria is like the initial place where where you really saw it play out how much al qaeda was like listen you know we're not like that they're a little crazy sure you know what i mean and that is really saying something about from the kind of group. threat it is there but when when you were there i mean how many you're working with the client the special forces team like how many people are on the ground with you representing your company and how big did you say like the special forces group you were working with was? So on our particular compound, I would say there was, I don't want to talk about how many specifically, uh, how many Americans were on the ground, but it was a very small element. Right. We, we had a very, very small footprint. You're be basically a cell. Because of how remote we were. Um, but I do want to touch on what you said previously, like, hey, when it starts happening to white people, that's when other people get involved. Um, what I think is a, is a better way of putting that is I think a lot of Americans don't ha haven't had the opportunity to see the disparity between the first world and third world countries. And what I've tried to do um, in between building businesses and, and working in this field is I've tried to travel to as many different places as, as I possibly can. Um, I just got back from the Philippines not too long ago. I was in Thailand last year. Um, I make it a point to go to see parts of the world that a lot of Americans don't get to see uh, because of my the history of my family. Like we grew up in places like that, and you you learn very quickly about how the rest of the world lives and what is normal to us here in the first world is just not apparent at all in third world countries. So to give an example of that, um, people that we were dealing with when we were in Syria, the U.S. government is unfortunately charged to uh, deal with situations that are just nature of circumstance but are horrible in nature and what i mean by that is the u.s government has been responsible for <clears throat> um, taking care of the sons and daughters of isis fighters so kids who had no no political leaning or no leverage in the conflict but just happened to be born as the son or daughter of an isis warlord we have to figure out what you do with them we have to figure out where they live how they're fed how they're taken care of and because america is mm. in a leadership position we're often the ones that are responsible for making sure that those people um aren't left to the wolves and mm -hmm. you learn very quickly that when you travel to all these third world places that the majority of the world lives in the most dire of circumstances and the reason why things so why don't we care about that though well, because it goes back to what we were talking about originally, for the same reason that Americans are more concerned about what's going on in America versus, and I'm choosing my words very specifically here. No, I know. The mm. Holocaust that is going on in China right now with the weaker people. We conveniently ignore that because mm. we're too wrapped up in what's going on on Twitter or what the president is saying or um, what, what's going on with a, a celebrity trial. But there are millions of people who are being killed every day because they're not Chinese enough. And if more people could just see how the rest of the world lives, I feel it would give you a greater appreciation of what we have here and how important it is to keep it. Okay. So, because the, the game I hate to play, Okay. And, and it might be my fault for how this conversation is being phrased right now, but 
I hate to play the game of, well, this is worse than that. Sure. Like, to me, I, you heard me, I want world peace, right? Mm -hmm. I don't like what's happening in Yemen. I don't like what's happening in Ukraine. I think I think they're both terrible. One we just pay attention to, the other one we, we don't, and I question that. And you bring up the Uyghur thing in China. You know, some of it comes very honestly, I think. Where I get confused is why we do care about the stuff that happens in like Europe, like so much when it okay. does even here versus when it happens in other places, including like the one in China. And, you know, the the guy Chamoth, I never pronounced the name right. I'm really sorry. But the guy Chamoth Palapataya, maybe that's how you say it. He's, he's a billionaire, former high Facebook guy, like high ranking Facebook guy who is a venture capitalist, very, very smart guy. Okay. He's got a podcast, I want to say it's called the All In Podcast with Jason Calacanis and some of the guys out in Silicon Valley. But he took a lot of shit, I think it was last year, with the way he delivered a statement okay. where the Uyghur thing came up. And like it was a very memeable moment, unfortunately. I understood what he was trying to say. He got mm -hmm. ripped for it. I get what he's trying to say. But essentially... It was along the lines of like the clip that was taken completely out of context was him saying that is below my line. <laughs> He's like holding up his hand. He's like genocide below my line of caring. Got right? It. Came across very wrong. Okay. Very poor delivery. What the greater point he was trying to make is kind of what you're saying, which is that we have things to worry about here. Mm -hmm. We can't see that there. That is inside of a totalitarian regime that we're going to have to deal with at some point. Sure. Right now, it's not like we can just drop the U.S. forces in there to free this place. It's mm -hmm. not a realistic thing, which is very sad, but it's unfortunate, but sure. it's kind of a reality. And so in my list of things that I can sit here and actually affect in my seat making this content as a billionaire that people actually listen to, that is below my line, right? Sure. I get that. How do we determine that line, though? Why is that below the line, but then like... Ukraine isn't. Why aren't they both above the line? You know, does it, is it literally because of what I said? Like, oh, well, one, we can kind of affect the other. We technically can't right now. Is okay. that all it is? I think there's a couple of things that you're touching on here. First, I want to touch on the human element. Okay. So I'm going to bring up a very controversial point, but I came up Do it. all the way to this podcast and I'm on the East Coast. So fuck it. Um, there's a, LeBron James is a very politically divisive figure, obviously for some of his statements and some um, things. Yeah. One of the things that he's brought up is uh, police reform and police reform and police brutality is a subject that's very important to him, and rightfully so. The, the free speech is something that I, I believe in very strongly in America. Yeah. Um, I think it is very hypocritical of him to say, "Hey, there needs to be all these changes in America. Why why is all these atrocities of police brutality occurring in the first place? This is a racist country." However, when Chinese officials that are big fans of the NBA say, "Hey," you brought up Taiwan as a nation and you need to now apologize for it because a big part of the funding that comes from, or the, excuse me, the viewership that the NBA watches comes from a Chinese audience. You're saying when they say that to other people and he doesn't speak up about it. Exactly. Okay. So meaning <clears throat> it is hard to ask the American public to care about a particular issue that may not affect them while also not caring about another political issue that you're not a part of. Mm. Meaning, okay, I will apologize for my statements and say whatever the Chinese nation wants me to say in regards to this Taiwan situation because they're funding me and they're paying me and I'm an NBA star and I can follow the money that comes from the NBA and knows mm. that a big part of the viewership comes from a Chinese audience. I'm just not going to pay attention to the genocide that is occurring in China right now. And if, yeah. if your problem with America is racism and the atrocities that occur here, and there's plenty of them, I can say with confidence that Holocaust style camps and rounding up people and the, the re-education of an entire racial group of people to become more Mandarin is not occurring in the United States. It is very right. hi hypocritical when very pronounced political, not political figures, but celebrity figures in the United States conveniently ignore those things, but ask other people to pay attention to political subjects that may be more important to them. And I think that idea can be broadened out across all people. So with the Ukraine situation specifically, why do we care about this one particular region? A lot of people have tossed around, well, oh, because they're white people. You know, that's why all there's all this money and funding. I think the reason why the funding is occurring is because it aligns with the strategic interests of the United States. 
and it so happens to be convenient. So because this- What do you mean by that? This particular nation is parked up against Russia. And that particular nation is talking about joining NATO now. Obviously, the United States wants that, uh, I would think, to happen because it aligns with our political strategy for the world. Excuse me. But um, but could you see why not that, and I I can't fucking stand Putin, and I've okay. been reading about Putin for way longer than this war has been going on, and no one ever paid attention to the war happened, but could you see why that thing in particular, not to say like it merits invading a country, but sure. why that might piss him off? Well, I think it's very interesting that for a plan that I think he's had in the works for a minute, he took this political point in history to execute on. Meaning I think he's been thinking about invading the Ukraine for a minute. I think he chose a particular administration that is weak from a foreign perspective to choose to execute on that plan. I think he chose a very particular time in the United States when we're very politically divided to execute on this plan. Mm. Um, he could have done it when other presidents were in place, um, but chose to do it at this particular point in time. And I think the American public and where we are politically has a lot to do with that. Um, beyond that, um, I think at least when I went through school, uh, one of the messages that was taught to us is, hey, this Holocaust thing, we as a, as a race of humans, as, as mankind said, hey, we promise this is never going to happen again because of the atrocities and the yeah, genocides wow. and, and the, the horrible war crimes that were committed yeah. to this group of people. Yeah. And the unfortunate reality is it's happening today and we're conveniently ignoring it because- It's not the only time it's happened either. <laughs> yep. Because it's not happening to us. Or it's not right. happening in Europe. Right. Okay, there's a lot on the bone here, and I yep. want to try to get to all of it and of have a back and forth. So let's start with, and if I'm forgetting things as we move along, try to Go bring ahead. them back up. But let's start with LeBron. Okay. I'm a fan. Mm -hmm. I think LeBron has certainly made some mistakes with things he says, though. And, and I've had moments in my life, you can ask my friends, where I fucking hate the guy. Sure. You know, where I'm just like, what the fuck, you know, just shitty did piss me off. And I kind of had more of a Zen look on it in the last couple of years, especially. And obviously I'm a fan of his play. Like sure. he's an incredible player and he's done a lot of good too. He's, he's backed up a, a lot of, you know, you look at his foundational work and stuff like he has walked the talk with, with those mm -hmm. things as someone who came from a really tough situation and, and made it big. So I, I always look at the positive first with him. This China situation, I have a little bit of a nuanced view on, and okay. I'll explain why. And I'm not saying that what you're saying is wrong. I, I think what you're saying is overall correct with him. How he's looking at it, first of all, why, why, do, why do people in your mind, when they, when they go to the ballot box and they vote and they choose a candidate, let's say they're strongly in one direction okay. or another. How many real policies do you think they're voting on when they do that? One. Great answer. Yep. And I would even, let's be conservative, and let's say it's two or three. Mm -hmm. Either way, low number, right? But think about all the things that person, especially if it's a bigger role like president or senator, sure. is going to control. It's thousands, mm -hmm. tens of thousands, millions, right? They're voting on one thing. People hold the things that most affect them closest and this goes to a theme of the conversation sure. we've had today the things we can see the things we know about and lebron has gotten some things wrong sometimes when he calls out cots for certain situations and the one time where he put the picture of the guy up and that was actually a very good cop and that mm -hmm. was not something he should have done like yes that was wrong and like he should take shit for that sure but he is focused on things that affect like his community and problems he sees and i fully understand that with china Yes, overall, he's, he's, he's wrong in this opinion or in the complete inability to speak out, I think. But it is a very tough situation for him in particular, and here's where I, where I see why. Okay. He is a billionaire. He is not missing any meals. The average length of an NBA player's career, there's approximately, I think, 450 players who play in the NBA every sure. year is not long. Mm -hmm. These guys are not making crazy money. This is money that, you know, the bottom half of the league, these guys are going to have to live off of to say nothing of the top half of the league where people can start having this argument. If LeBron James decides to come out and be Muhammad Ali in this situation, which sure. I'm not saying is the wrong move, I think it's probably the right move. But he is going to take all kinds of money out of the pockets of the people who actually need it. 
and who have no control. And if they came out and said something, it would have no effect, right? And so he now has all his peers as the ambassador of the game who are going to have money taken out of their pocket. Now you say, hold on, there's a genocide going on though. We're not speaking out about that. Very fair point. Very fair point. But he can't see it. Mm-hmm. We don't see it. It's hard to Google and sure. actually see it. Like a lot of this is 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 stuff that we have to re- rely on accounts of people who have been on it, which mm-hmm. I, I understand. Like we got to do that. Sure. But, you know, he is stuck in that situation where it's like, well, am I going to be persona non grata if I do it? Now, when he dogpiles Daryl Morey for saying something, fuck that. I mm-hmm. don't like that. That's bullshit. Just shut up. Sure. Don't Don't say anything right there. You know, so I'm not going to excuse stuff like that. But it is it is a weird situation that actually david stern the last commissioner of the nba summed up perfectly there was a new york times written interview that he did so it wasn't on video this Mm -hmm. is back in maybe oh four oh five oh six i can't remember the exact year but you can google it and find it there's a written interview he did i think i want to say he was on a plane with a new york times reporter and he brought it up now as commissioner of the nba Your job is you are hired by the owners to serve the financial interests of the owners. You have a fiduciary duty to them. So you have to look at all things that are financially acceptable. This is a pre-social media time too. Maybe there's less geopolitical thoughts with business, you know, different time. But David Stern brought up, and I'm paraphrasing, the idea that this China thing, and I think the reporter described it as he leaned his head back and like sighed and looked up at the sky. He's like, this China thing is a problem. That is a totalitarian communist regime that has human rights issues and at some point that chicken is going to come home to roost and i'm probably not going to be here when that happens but holy shit and again i'm paraphrasing but that is approximately what he said and so you now have this kick the can down the road situation where now they're making so much money and it's like you're in this group think scenario while all of us looking here would like to look in history and say, ooh, we wouldn't be Hugo Boss during World War II and yep. being funded by Hitler. And like, but are these guys Hitler? I mean, they're doing some of the same shit. Mm-hmm. It is a tough thing. And again, I think you're right. I'm just saying I think some of the intentions of some of these people, including LeBron, aren't evil. Sure. They're They're making perhaps a mistake with, you know, the road to hell paved with good intentions. Could be that type of situation. I just want to make sure I gave you the context. Of course. Beyond that, don't preach then, I think is a fair point. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Beyond that, though, at a higher strategic level, this is the part that scares me. This is where I think China is doing something differently than the Russians did, or excuse me, the USSR did. China has found a way to weave its way into American culture in a way that's inseparable from all the things that we enjoy. Basketball is is one of those examples. So during the last Cold War, we had movies like Red Dawn coming out where people were holding up AKs and screaming Wolverines and, you know, the only good commie is a dead commie. And that was the rallying cry of Hollywood. There is no way that that movie would be made right now because of the amount of influence that China has in the American market, where these big Hollywood studios now have to get films and scripts and actors cleared to be watched in a Chinese market. And I think one of the long-term plays of the CCP is, hey, one of the biggest strengths that America has is a cultural strength. And if we can attack that, the whole empire falls apart because it's the heart of America. So to all these big celebrity figures that are just worried about, hey, you know, I want to make as much money as I can in this short amount of time period, because exactly like you said, like, hey, this is in the same position that I was in. This is not a lifetime's worth of money, I'm going to just make it in a span of a decade. Um, You have to realize what's going on because you may be compromising your integrity on the sake of the American empire, or excuse me, on the sake of the American nation. Meaning these these adversaries, specifically the CCP, is using these these for-profit institutions as a tool to, um, to shake America at its core. And this is an example of that. The NBA knows that a big majority of its viewer base, just from a numbers perspective, comes from a Chinese audience. So when uh, celebrities like John Cena are apologizing in Mandarin for referencing Taiwan as a nation, it gives me pause. Because it should. The last Cold War was one, number one, because we outspent the USSR from a, a nuclear perspective and from a military perspective. But I think it was also from a cultural war. Uh, the, Ber- the Berlin Wall falling was an American victory, but it was also a victory for the world. 
And I think if if these people that are in leadership positions and are in a position where they are preaching at the American public to think and feel a certain way, that they should be the ones that are that are saying, hey, you know, we have problems, but I stand up for democratic values. And I can't ask other people to, to maybe consider the perspective of someone who wasn't born in a particular environment or situation or neighborhood, while at the same time not considering people who were born an ocean away, who are in the, the most dire of circumstances, who would love to be anyone in America. Before I forget, you're you're wide open on time today, right? Yes, absolutely. Because I'm just there's something I'm thinking about. I'd like to stay after this podcast is done and record a little mini episode for Patreon because it won't be suitable for YouTube and okay. we will get your episode demonetized. And you know we want to tr try to push this. So if that's cool, I'm there's here. a topic in there. I just put a bullet point on it so I don't forget it. But we'll talk about that after. But what was the second thing? You started that whole thing with the LeBron situation mm -hmm. with the with the tete a tete of like, is it China versus are you only going to care about U.S. policies? But there was a second level to it because I wanted to make sure we got to all of it. Do you no, remember what that was? I just want to touch on the point that, hey, I think these are human beings uh, in this particular case and human beings only care about things that, you know, um, are are specific to their political interests or maybe that one vote issue. That they find themselves in and then uh how just at a bigger strategic level it plays into some of the global politics that we're talking about right now so even though if oh, right, right, if right. lebron doesn't speak up and say hey you know or john cena speak up and say hey i am not apologizing in mandarin for acknowledging another sovereign state as a nation no i am not doing that and if i make less money so be it if if he compromises his integrity in that position to make more money, it becomes a domino effect where the CCP as a whole, in my opinion, is just going to garner more and more influence in American culture. It's a problem. It, it, it's, it, it is a big problem. Do, do you, have you heard what that guy Peter Zahan no, says about China? He's been, he's a guy that fans put on my radar maybe nine, 10 months ago. And I didn't know who he was, so I started following him, and then he got on Rogan. I was like, oh, there goes that. Sure. But <laughs> now people still ask me to bring him on all the time. He's a very smart guy. I like him. He's one of those dudes, though, who's, like, so smart that he comments on every single thing with a hardcore opinion. Okay. So it's like I kind of break it down like this. He's probably like damn near 100% right on half the things he says. Okay. And then of the other half, there's 25 and 25. Mm -hmm. 25 where he's kind of got a mixed bag where he's got themes right. And maybe a couple things where something's out of context or slightly off. And then 25 where it's probably like, all right, that's probably not right. Or you're looking at this the wrong way. And God knows if I can put everything in the right box. I wouldn't be sitting here if I were smart enough to do that. Okay. But, you know, he, I mentioned it earlier a little bit. He talks about the demographic problems in China and the supply chain problems and what's going on there and how this is actually going to have sort of the opposite effect. And I'm tying that together in my head with your historical timelines sure. you brought up where you talked about how, for example, in the 60s, shit was bad. And then the Soviet Union fell in, let's say, like 1991 or 1992, what okay. the official date was. So it fell throughout the 80s. You had the mm -hmm. cooling off period, right? And then culminates with that. So you had good around the corner of bad. Could it be lining up that the things you're talking about with China, because of some of these other problems that Zeihan points out, mm -hmm. perhaps they are correct there, they're lining up in a way such that, you know, you're going to kind of have... For example, like some of the COVID shit backfire on China, like we're already seeing, and we're going to have that good thing around the corner where maybe in the 30s, enough of their people rise up and overthrow the CCP, which, you know, David Satter was in here and talks about it. Sure. It only took 15% of USSR society to overthrow the USSR. Before the KGB, there was the NKVD in the 30s that was responsible for murdering hundreds of thousands of people. Like the pogroms and stuff? No, no, no. Pogroms were uh, ethnic, uh, anti-Jewish for the most part. Right. Riots. Right. No, this was the great terror during the 1930s that Stalin launched against real and imagined opponents in order to bring the country completely to its knees. You know, I'm not saying it could be the same in China, but like... You don't have to get like 60% of the people to do it. You get a really, really loud group of people who are willing to put their names and beings behind it, and it can happen. 
You know, maybe these trends, maybe some of these things we're seeing with starving populations, people who are dirt poor, you know, being locked down in their houses with COVID, with drones monitoring them. You saw some of those little riots that were happening, and they weren't that little, actually, you know, and I, I think it was like maybe October, November. You know, and then the CCP had to end those guidelines they had because they right. realized, oh, shit, right? Like, do you think that th- that can kind of solve itself? I think if it gets to that point, if we think a lot of people are dying now, I can only imagine how many innocent people are going to die in a circumstance like that. Because China, yeah. the, the amount of po- progress that they have made in the past 30 years is undeniable. You went from uh, what was arguably a third world country for everybody, where there was starvation uh, across uh, its entire population. You've seen a rise in capitalism because of a shifting in policies that because capitalism works, it has given more resources and more equity and and more financial services to average everyday people. Um, I don't think the Chinese will go quietly into the night giving any of that up. And they like the the presence mm. that they now have on the world stage. And to give that up and to just let their own people revolt or overthrow the CCP, millions would die in the process before that would happen. Well, they wouldn't let them. Of we course. know that. We know that. And that's – see, that's a shitty reality you bring up. Mm-hmm. Millions would die. You know, that is their country though. Yeah. Right. People, people care about their ability to be free and things like that. And people are throughout history have been heroes and and laid down their life. And God knows, I don't want to get involved in telling people what to do or whatever. But I saw cracks in the foundation. I saw people in October, I think it was October, November, who looked like they were at their wits end. They Mm -hmm. looked like the kind of people who I don't want to use the term death wish, but they looked like the kind of people like, you know what? Put a fucking bullet in my head if this isn't going to change because I'm going to do that myself if you don't. Well, Julian, we are living in a country that was founded from people who did exactly that. Yes. We're, I'm in a part of the country now where people said things like give me liberty or give me death because of all the things that you're talking about. And I think those things are not only important to the American story, but I think they're important to the human story. And the reason why I'm so bullish on America as a nation is because even with all our problems and even with all our our political divisiveness that we have, America has always stood for those values. And the reason why I think we're going to win on a long enough timeline is because all our adversaries that we've talked about at length in this podcast, they don't stand for those things. And if you give history enough time to unfold in the manner that it that it will in my opinion i think the world wants to stand for things like equity and freedom and and uh liberty and freedom and values to as many people in as many places as possible and i think america has always been the driving catalyst of those things not only because of the founding of the nation but because of what we believe in and more specifically what western culture believes in as a whole Mm. and i think part of the reason why the united states does as well as it does from an economic standpoint and part of the reason why europe does as well as it does from an economic standpoint is because those values are interwoven into the economic system in those countries. In China, that's not the case. There's an American idea that, and this is becoming more difficult than ever, to buy property and to buy home and to build build something Mm. in America about the American dream of owning something that is is owned in your name. In China, that is not the case. The if you want to buy real estate, I believe you can sign a 99 year lease with the Chinese government to own or at least rent or lease a piece of property that is that is owned by the CCP over the span of a lifetime. Really? And I didn't the, know that. the reason why the, I forget the name of the company, but the biggest um, <clears throat> real estate agency in China was causing the amount of economic strife that it had in the nation recently is because the only way that people can invest in China is through real estate. All the stock market and all the, the, financial tools that are apparent uh, in China are reserved for the CCP directly and have very limited amount of control in investing. Versus the United States is if you have money and you want to make more money, the the tools and resources and financial services that we have in the United States are available to everybody because they align with our Western values to begin with. I think that on a long enough timeline, besides all the cheesy patriotism that I believe in will win the day because people just want better people can do it. better lives for not only their children, but their children's children. You're differentiating government and sovereign citizen in this way. Yep. Where we have the ability as sovereign citizens to do this kind of thing. 
they don't there, but their government obviously values real estate. I'm not talking about their own real estate. I'm mm-hmm. talking about like around the world and shit. Because sure. they're buying it through their citizens who look like sovereign citizens, but really they're billionaires who are fucking at the beck and call of the government. I would argue that's not Chinese people trying to improve their lot in life. Yes. In, in the same way that, hey, if I want to buy property in Europe to improve my, my uh, financial portfolio, I think that is a tool that the CCP is using to garner influence in those nations. I don't think it's average oh, everyday people trying to lift themselves out of poverty and create a better world for their children. I think it's a, a tool that the CCP is using to pull power away from us. Of course they're doing that. And I mean, you talk about it with, that's a great example you gave with like Red Dawn was made, but you know, that shit wouldn't be made with nope. with that about China today. And like, there's one I looked at yesterday. I don't want to give the specific example out loud yet because I need to look into it a little more, but there's there's a major Hollywood production that's going on now that is funded by, shall we say, some very openly sketchy people, in this case related to China. And it's and by the way, to be fair, it's not just them. Like it, when you really look at like the production credits and some in, in different content, there are adversaries around the world who are working their way in there. China is just, I think, the biggest problem of it, and they have the most volume of it. And I sure. think I think the data is pretty clear on that. But there's one I was looking at where it looks that way again, and it's a production that's going to be making quite a political statement domestically here. Okay. And what's you know, the film? I'm not going to say yet because I need to I need to verify that tie completely. I don't want to just put out something that then I'm going to have to say, oh, shit, sorry, I was wrong. Okay. But it's not the first time I've seen that, right? And so when I look at things like that, yeah, I, I think your argument is not only valid, it's backed up. You know, you talked about John Cena apologizing in Mandarin. It's like you're apologizing that a country exists that you said because you know that's what it is and mm-hmm. now it affects your wallet and now you're doing it. It just, it leaves a horrible taste in your mouth. You know, sure. those are the things that we can control. We can control when LeBron James doesn't have to say Daryl Morey needs to educate himself on this mm-hmm. situation. You know, like that, that's stupid. Sure. Um, and, and I think people, people, it, it's you, those situations are used as lightning rods, especially, you know, when it's celebrities and things like that. It's, it's easy in this society we live in now for, you know, us and them, the 99 and the one, and ooh, look at what they're saying from their sure. perch. And sometimes they do bring it on themselves. Like, I can't, it is what it is. Like, if you say shit like that, like, you know, you're going to get shit for it. Well, I think it's very easy for people to come on a podcast and talk into a microphone. I think it's an, another thing to, um, actually put their money where their mouth is and have their actions represent what they believe in. Um, We're tossing American flags and everything because it's who we are as people. And those values come through in the work that we produce because it's what what we believe in and what we stand for. So it's, I understand the LeBron is dealing with money on a much bigger scale than I am dealing with, but the, the, the money that I have poured into this company comes just it's a direct representation of how much I believe in the product and how much I believe in the people we're trying to caffeinate. And I will never compromise on those values because they're values that I believe in. What if those values cost your business its ability to exist or cost it significant money? I will never remove our, our patriotism or support of law enforcement or our support of first responders from our organization because of all the things that we're talking about. Fair enough. Because yeah. they, 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 those people, in my opinion, are the silent majority that we talked about in this country. And I think a lot of the times they are roped into conversations that they don't want to have to begin with. Well, yeah. and and But that's the thing. There is some times, though, where you know, it turns into this wall. Like, I, I do not like the whole blue lives matter thing. I can't stand that okay. shit, you know, because it is, and I'm sure that's probably an opinion you don't have, but, you know, it's like, it goes back to the equal but opposite reaction. I also thought at Ferguson, the organization Black Lives Matter was full of shit okay. because they were taking a hashtag that was supposed to mean something and monetizing it into a whole bunch of other shit. And that has now been, the lid has been blown off that for a long time. And I've been on that. People can roll the earliest podcast I did with Terrence Jones where I said that back in 2020. And I was saying that back in 2014, right? So I'm very consistent on this stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think what happens is people go into their silos and it becomes an us and them conversation. And not to be like an oversimplified, you know, 
victim of the content and being like, oh, that's the truth. But God damn it, do I love when I see content of where like cops are getting along with people and you sure. know, there's there's great back and forth. And I know there's a lot of great law enforcement in the country. I've had some on my show, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm not so I don't want to be like an anti cop person or something sure. like that. But I think when we especially like even with businesses and things like that, when we play to that flag, you talked about human beings being natural and tribes and stuff like that. It it sometimes it, without intention, it can it can further perpetuate those differences and those lines that exist. And like, you know, I want law enforcement to be there to be the people that help protect people. And I want the people who are around them to feel like, you know, they got someone who serves their community great. Sure. That's all I want, you know? And I think that people, you know, I call it the Wawa theory. We were talking about that earlier. When I go to Wawa, I see the green haired girl hold the door for the guy in the nom hat. Love that. God bless you know what that. I mean? Right. And you already talked about it, how social media blows shit out of proportion because the loudest people with the megaphone want to say shit. Yep. You're 100% right about that. And I think when we start to to separate some things out sometimes, we lose sight of that and suddenly we think that the, the, the door holding situation is always the exception. And it doesn't have to be that way, you know? I think, too, I want to touch on this specifically. Um, I think it was a very politically divisive time in America when the Black Lives Matter uh, movement was churning through America. Um, I think who was caught in the crossfire in a, in, a major, in a large amount of situations were normal police officers that were just going to work yes. and trying to feed their families and trying to provide a, a home for their children. And they were called just, they were roped in with the worst of the worst. Yes. And I will never be in support of an organization that not only calls for things like um, all cops are horrible people, or I will never be in support of an organization that wants to take away funding and resources and training from those organizations. Unfortunately, what, what came from the Black Lives Matter movement was this big call to defund the police and to take resources away from law enforcement agencies. And I think it shows the, the malice of intent that is behind these organizations. Because what I would argue is if you want better policing tactics, which I think is a common ground that all parties, regardless of what side of the political spectrum you fall on, I think better training and better equipment will stop horrible situations from even occurring in the first place. We need to put ourselves uh, in a situation where we can actually take law enforcement officials off the streets and put them in training environments Agreed. where they can better de-escalate situations Agreed, to, to better handle the tumultuous situations that average everyday people with badges and guns find themselves in. The only way you're going to do that is with more funding and more resources and more capital. And when you have an organization that is crying to defund the police because they don't like police officers, or I'm going to speak to the police perspective. I'm not one. This is just, we work with a lot of cops, the, the co-founder of the company, as well as the my business partner is a is a police officer right um when when you were calling for mental health officials to roll alongside police officers to better de-escalate situations um i think it is used in a perfect world it would be great but when there are when there are very very unstable people that are uh, causing harm to themselves and others in common places all the mental health officials in the world are not going to help a common situation uh, that occurs is you'll have an unstable person that finds themselves in uh, a gas station or uh, a public space and is causing harm to themselves and others. Right. Uh, a common critique from the Black Lives Matter movement is, hey, why don't we have a, a mental health specialist that can come into that situation and better de-escalate the situation better than the police officer? The reality of the situation is that um, that person can quickly harm, ha harm to others. You just said something, though, that's in the middle ground that I hadn't heard because yes, you're, I believe you're correct about that. Black Lives Matter wanted to take the cops out of the situation completely. Sure. Right. Disagree. I, I'm, I'm with you. Okay. But you said in there, maybe it was like a misspeak. Mm -hmm. You were saying having them come alongside police officers. Now that's interesting. I've heard that before. Um, I, I think it would be interesting to see it as how it would be used as a tool. But I think that perspective comes from people who have never dealing with, who have never been in that situation in the first place. When you're dealing with, in many cases, people who have mental health issues or people who are just unstable individuals. Um, you're saying mental health professionals haven't been in that environment? No, I'm saying when, when unstable people are in a situation where they can calm, cause harm to themselves and others, unfortunately, you're going to have a situation where you need people that can control that particular mm. individual. And that is never, unfortunately, going to look good on camera. 
I think unfortunately what happens is you have officers that find themselves in normal calls and normal situations that have to take control of a very mentally unstable person and people catch a 10 second uh, video clip of an officer tackling someone or an officer because of poor training, uh, applying yes. an arm bar incorrectly yep. and causing more harm. Yep. When the, in my opinion, part of the solution would be providing those officers with better training to not only restrain those people in the first place, but giving the benefit of the doubt to the officer because of how crazy the situation is to begin with. We pay these people to deal with the situations that none of us deal with. And I think it is very easy to criticize people who yes. have never found themselves in a physical altercation with a mentally unstable person um, calling for the officers to employ better tactics or use better chokeholds. Like, okay, I, I enjoy jujitsu. Um, I, I try to train as much as I can. Um, I have heard from several police officers that I train with that the chokeholds that we use in jujitsu, their police departments tell them to not employ be, <laughs> because of the 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 message that it relays when it's filmed you see an officer choking someone when as someone who grapples with people several times a week i can tell you firsthand that the best way to control someone that doesn't involve hitting them over and over again is to apply chokeholds but because it doesn't look good on camera and because the american public would have a certain perception of it yeah those tactics are disbarred to for to ever be used in the first place shit like that is is problematic and i'm so with you on the training man i think that is the biggest thing the worst is when i see a donut patrolman in a bad situation because they just don't know what to do you know not just and whether not just going yep. for the gun or something but they you know they get in a physical altercation they have no fucking idea i could i could put them in a pretzel you know and that's sure. not good right so you know, to be, that's why that defund argument in that facet was a total, it was an L argument. And like, again, shit that was coming out of Black Lives Matter, the organization, like that has been exposed at this point. Like it, they, they didn't give a fuck, in my opinion, about black people and black rights. It was money making. It's, it, it was, it was the bastardization of capitalism. It's the downside of capitalism when you see that. And half their problem was a war against capitalism and they were the biggest proponents of it. Can I pause Shit you on like that, point? that I, I agree with you completely. I think it's interesting when that organization had not only the support of the American people, it had the wet dream of every other non-for-profit in the world. If the American Heart Association, if the American Red Cross could have direct donation links on Amazon.com that could contribute directly to their organization, imagine all the good that they could accomplish. Yeah. This particular organization had every single advantage that we could possibly give to a non-for-profit, and it not only misused funds, but paid people uh, through corruption. And, and key leaders put certain people that they knew in their family or, or had relations with or relationships with in key leadership positions so they could get great salaries. Yep. When stuff like that starts happening, your argument falls apart to me. Yes. And I think it's interesting that uh, when this is brought up, um, the benefit of the doubt is given to Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter organization. Still? Just hate. I mean, in some of the mainstream media, maybe, but they don't really even talk about it anymore. But they don't talk about it. Whereas if an officer finds himself in a precarious true. situation, it is CNN news tonight. That's true. And no one gives that officer the benefit of the doubt. And again, we believe in this because it's not only who we're caffeinating, but who we are as people. And I will never, I will never support an organization or put, put my company or myself in a position where we're standing up for organizations that try to do more harm than good. Yeah, no, I, I would. And, and to be clear, I wasn't telling you to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm not a supporter at all. I think it's, I think it's trash. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I been on record about that myself with my friends since 2014. I've been on record publicly since 2020 when I started this thing. So you get no arguments there. I just think that, you know, the equal but opposite reaction that's happened has also formed tribes that, that, that contribute to the problem. And, you know, I think good people get caught in the middle of that. And I just, again, I'm a kumbaya guy. I want people to be happy and fucking go sure. along and live in good communities. And however we can do that, like, or do more of it at the very least, like, let's do it. But listen, man, you and I are going to stay and record some shit for Patreon because there's there was a big can of worms in there that we can go into that's not good for YouTube for sure. But Phenomenal. But this was this was a wide range of conversation. I, I really appreciate it. There was all kinds of geopolitical stuff, some domestic stuff, your backstory. You had a very interesting early career too, in the mm -hmm. sense that you got right into this when you were eighteen. So once again, I really appreciate you coming all the way to the East Coast for this and and sharing your experiences with everybody. Thank you for having me on, brother. I of love course. Being here. And what's that direct link again? That's senditsups.com.
Okay, we'll put that in the description so everyone can check it out. I'm going to try this, too. Please do. It's good when I work out. And I'm not a dipper. I've never been a dipper. Never Are you been. a caffeine junkie? Not a caffeine junkie, but okay. like I always have coffee sitting on the desk when we do this. I like caffeine. You'll so. love it. All right, cool. Well, everyone else, check it out. Send it subs.com. FDA approved. FDA obviously, approved. everything all good. Yep. And we're going to stick around. But if you haven't subscribed, make sure you do that. If you haven't liked the video, please do that as well. Hope to see you for the next episodes. Thank you for watching. Give it a thought. Get back to me. Peace.